well-organized satanic groups are creating a reign of death and destruction. These highly destructive Satanists make families their primary targets. They believe that the breakdown of the family unit will guarantee the destruction of goodness, morality, and civilization. 50% of bizarre murders may be linked directly to satanic and other occult organizations. Members of satanic or occult groups share common traits, the desire to perform certain bizarre acts that society condemns, mind control, or the power to force others to act out whatever is commanded of them, and the access to perform perverted sex acts, such as homosexuality, bisexuality, and necrophilia. All of these acts are carried out in the name of Satan, and that is when the nightmare begins for decent people everywhere. The Cross of Confusion is an ancient Roman symbol, the letters ACDC, Antichrist, Devil Child. Sometimes you may see the goat's head superimposed within the pentagram. The hexagon, also referred to as the Seal of Solomon, is frequently used by many young people in the occult world. Horns and tail added to any letter of the alphabet. I am the sayer of the law. Here come all that be new to learn the law. Say the words. Learn the law. Members of satanic and occult groups come from all walks of life. They desire quick answers and the ability to cause instant changes. Others are drawn into Satanism by heavy metal rock music. Anton Sandor LaVey, founder of the Church of Satan, was once a circus lion tamer. To help determine if someone you know is drawn to Satanism, review these levels of satanic involvement. The fun and games level may include conversations, which could lead into the second level, referred to as the dabblers. Joining a satanic or occult group will, in time, lead into the no turning backstage, where warning signs of satanic behavior may be apparent. You should look further for ritual items such as a pentagram, a chalice or goblet, a decorative dagger or knife, a personal diary with a black cover, which is called a book of shadows, and possibly a small altar. If you discover items such as these, contact your local law enforcement agency at once. Overcoming this evil begins with every family. Parents must provide attention and love protecting their children from corrupt influences. When this is accomplished, you can be confident that children will grow into happy, well-adjusted, and productive citizens, free from satanic and occultic influences.
Hi, and you're now with the Forerunner Chronicles. All right, everybody, quick video. Right now, I'm out in California. I got an airplane that I got to jump on in like two hours, but the info that I got to share with you, I got to get it to you ASAP. And you know, that's what this video is about, the group ASAP, and in particular, one of the members, ASAP Rocky. Let me explain. A few minutes ago, I jumped on the internet and I got a Skype from one of my entertainment insiders. Now, this guy began to share with me how he came in contact with the group ASAP Rocky at an industry event that he recently attended. Now, unfortunately, my inside entertainment guy did not want to go on the screen with the Skype interview and reveal this information to you himself personally. So, to respect his anonymity, I'm not going to tell you his name, neither the entertainment outfit that he's associated with at this time, but I will share with you the information. When he told me that he was at that industry event and came in contact with ASAP Rocky, I knew exactly what he was getting ready to talk about next. I noticed that within their videos, there was a ton of occult symbology. These guys playing with Bibles, standing inside of Baphomets. The clothing line that they're wearing has the compass and square. It's called Black Label and has Baphomets on it. These guys fully are promoting the occult. And ladies and gentlemen, this is not the only group that is guilty for using a high amount of occult symbology within their videos. What's going on right now within the entertainment industry and media at large, period, is the fulfilling of Alice Bailey's stratagem to make all of the arts occultic, music, poetry, um, arts, etc., to make them immoral, occultic, obscene, all of these things. It is a part of the New Age Movement's agenda to establish a one world government system under which Lucifer will be acknowledged as sovereign. Why? Because our minds will be already acclimated to receiving these demonic suggestions as something that is good because we have enjoyed it in our music, we've enjoyed it in our television programs, our cartoons, our video games, and in our clothing. ASAP is a new group that is just blowing up the same way that Odd Future blew up, the same way that Lady Gaga blew up, and every other artist that is jumping in the industry right now that is making sure that within their videos, on the clothing that they're wearing, they are throwing out occult symbols all over the place and connected with those occult symbols within their music, though they may not make a conscious decision to do this, but because they've become ready agents of the devil, because they have submitted their hearts not to Jesus Christ, but to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. The very principles contained within their music are the very principles that are connected to the symbols that are being promoted from the occult. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what's transpiring. Going back to the story, my entertainment insider was at this event, came in contact with ASAP Rocky and was impressed because this group came up out of Harlem, New York, came up out of nothing, and just recently they got a million dollar deal. I wasn't surprised because I saw that they were connecting themselves with the occult. So that is always going to be the direct result of that type of activity. And so he, he got one of their mixtapes, went home, he began to listen to it over and over and over and over again in his car, in his home. But one night as he was listening to one of the particular songs, he saw some eyes in the dark. His room was dark and he saw some eyes in the room. And then he began to feel like he was being ripped from the inside out. What he was experiencing was a demonic attack. Ladies and gentlemen, how do you think that you can profess to be Christians and listen to the music of the world at the same time? The Bible is very clear in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. In the book of Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 28, we are told, Keep thy heart, thy mind, your emotions, and your desires. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Our mind is the citadel in which the Spirit of God desires to abide with us for eternity if we submit our hearts to Jesus Christ. But the devil is trying to make it his resting place, his throne room, and we as quote unquote professed Christians are giving him full reign within our lives by continuing to view and listen to this corrupt entertainment. ASAP Rocky, Lady Gaga, Kanye West, 
Tyler the Creator and Odd Future, Wolfgang Kill Them All, all these guys, they're just examples of what's going on on a broad scale with the entire media industry at large. Why? Because it is the agency, the platform by which the devil can reach the masses in the shortest period of time and you're falling for this garbage hook, line and sinker. When are you going to make a clear and concise decision within your heart to make a break with the world? The Bible tells us in the book of 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, it is not of the Father, it is of the world. You have to make a decision. I understand that the music is attractive. I understand the media is attractive. I was in the industry. I was producing that garbage to dwarf your minds, to pervert your intellect, and to draw you out of a relationship with Jesus Christ. I was a part of that whole system. But I'm telling you from the inside out, it's time to make a clear break. Choose you this day whom you will serve. You want ASAP Rocky? Have him. Trust me, you need to stop listening to that garbage as soon as possible. That's what ASAP is an acronym for. Get it out of your life. And anything else that might be separating you from having an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Our only hope in these last days is Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in the book of James chapter 4 and verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore shall be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. You can't continue to walk on this imaginary line. There is no fence separating the world and Christ. You can either be with Christ or be with the world. Either or, there is no fence activity going on here. If you're on the fence, you're in the devil's camp, bottom line. I need to stop the nonsense. The Bible is very clear. You can read the Bible all day long. You can pray all day long. But if you continue to inundate your mind with this corrupt, perverted, occult, satanic filth, you will corrupt the simplicity of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to give you that victory over sin in your life. You won't have it. Because these things strip you of it and they make you vessels in which demonic spirits can dwell. And trust me, I know exactly what I'm talking about. You can't continue in this path. It's time to make a clear decision. The New Age agenda is being fulfilled. It's being carried out and it will be carried out to the T. The question is, are you going to be one of the people that fall for the deception? The truth is here. If you want it, get it. It's free. It's available. But if you want the world, take that too. Good luck with that. This is a forerunner. I got to catch a plane. But whether you like it or not, the truth is the truth. <laughs>
Now wait a minute, I didn't even want to get an implantable microchip in the first place. Now we're talking about brain chips. Putting a chip in my actual brain. You can't tell me that people are actually going to want to do this. Uh, a lot of people who do want to upgrade themselves, no question about that. And there'll be commercial interests and political interests supporting those groups. There's a lot of money to be made here, a lot of power. I'm not even satisfied with the power structures that are present in this world right now, let alone giving the power of my brain away to somebody. And did you notice the buzzword you used in there, upgrade? As if you're going to be better if you do this? I mean, imagine you're a parent and your next door neighbor starts going cyborg, right? starts adding components, and then suddenly the person next door is capable of learning a human language in just by, you know, in seconds. And this, of course, is the old marketing trick of snob appeal. But this time, your neighbor hasn't bought a new riding mower. He's added a brain chip to his head, which allows him to think in ways that you can't even imagine. He's become a super intelligent cyborg. At this point, transhumanism tries to sell you on the concept of abandoning humanity altogether. They want you to become what is known as a post-human. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to keep up in the new society. But I, I think when implants become more acceptable, as they are becoming bit by bit, so such people, the, the humanists that want to stay human, the Terrans maybe, as Hugo would call them, uh, they, I, I can't see them ultimately having much power, because at the end of the day, their intellectual capabilities will be so inferior to cyborgs, those that have implants and upgrades, that the cyborgs will be able to outthink the subspecies that still are human. Ah, so humans are a subspecies now. Can anybody see where this is going? Perhaps you remember Adolf Hitler and his concept of the Ubermensch, or the Superman. These guys have a serious god complex. They are sick individuals. But you are even sicker if you choose to follow them. If in the 30s you met somebody, some, say you get some boffin person, big hit if you like, speaking on the radio in the 30s, saying uh, pretty soon, five, ten years into the future, it will be possible to build one bomb so powerful that it could wipe out a whole city. Well, most people would <laughs> just laugh at me, think the guy's a nutcase. But the nuclear physicists of that time were starting to speculate about the possibility of a chain reaction. Of course, all the simple-minded naysayers didn't even believe that it could be possible. But those brilliant scientists proved by the sheer power of the will that it could be done. And now, of course, we're being forced into the next step of the scientific evolutionary process which ends up with a clash between Terrans, aka humans, and cyborgs slash AI intelligence machines. They're not, they're not just prepared to see like millions of people die, like in a conventional type of war. They're prepared to see, to risk the whole species dies out, billions of people. So, so that the Terrans can easily justify their actions you know, when push really comes to shove, as, as I see it. To, to, to just wipe them out. So, as you can see, Dr. Daguerre isn't too concerned with the complete destruction of humanity. In fact, he seems quite pleased with the idea. And who am I to question his opinion anyway? After all, he is an expert, and we're supposed to listen to experts. Let's hear more of his brilliant ideas and concepts. So imagine uh, a young woman, she's just given birth, and then she she needs to make the decision. Is she, is she going to have her baby modified? Is she going to turn that baby into a, a cyborg or effectively an artifact? So say she, say she decides to do that. So this, you know, hypothetically, this grain of sand, in a sense, that's been nanotech, is uh, inserted into the human brain, that baby's brain, and it integrates itself into the brain. So that baby, in effect, is no longer human. So, that woman, in a sense, has killed her baby. Killed, in a sense, the baby's no longer human. It's effectively an artelect. It's an artelect in human disguise. Okay, first hydrogen bombs are now killing babies. This is the kind of expert I should be listening to. 
Now let's see what Dr. Warwick says about anybody who has the audacity to actually resist this. So the future for an ordinary, everyday human, I, I guess there'll be some sort of subspecies, uh, just like we have cows now, um, so we'll have humans in the future. There'll be other creatures, other species, cyborgs, in, intelligent machines, that are the dominant life forms on Earth. And as a cyborg, if a, a human came to see me and it starts making silly noises, a bit like a cow does now. If a cow comes to me and says, moo, 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 I, I'm not going to say, yeah, that's a great idea, I'm going to do what you tell me. So it will be with a human. Then they'll come in and start making these silly noises that we call speech and human language and so on. And I'll have these trivial noises. I'm not going to do those silly things. Why should I? This creature is absolutely stupid in comparison to me. And there you have the transhumanist sales pitch, brought to you, of course, by the experts. And if you didn't know, transhumanism is just the new face of eugenics, which you should look into. All this talk about super intelligence and how great it's going to be to be a cyborg is simply bait. This is an advertisement. Don't believe it for one second. This time, your brain is the product, and how can you possibly put a price on that? The fact of the matter is, you don't get to program the brain chip, so how do you know what it does? The general public hasn't been made aware of the transhumanist movement yet. But it's my contention that the mass marketing of this movement will happen in the near future. Consider this video a forewarning. The transhumanists also push the concept of downloading consciousness into a computer. This makes the concept of the movie The Matrix a reality. I'm not even going to try to explain the reasons why that's a bad idea. Let's just hear what Dr. Warwick has to say about it. Then if a machine is passing down signals that keep you completely happy, then why not be part of the Matrix? I, I really do think uh, Neo in the Matrix trying to destroy things, he's a bit of a party pooper, and life for humans in a Matrix could be really cool. This is Edward Alexander Crowley, also known as Aleister Crowley. He styled himself the wickedest man in the world. He believed himself to be the great beast. And he changed his name to Aleister Crowley so he, it would add up in both English, Hebrew, and Greek Kabbalah as 666. In 1904, Crowley had a communication with an extraterrestrial being named Ewas. And this being, through his wife, <clears throat> kind of a channeling type operation, brought forth a book that was called the Book of the Law in 1904. And this book declared that the slain and risen God had stepped off the throne and that a new God, the crowned and conquering child, was taking his place. He was a brilliant genius. He could play eight chess games blindfolded. He was an accomplished poet mountaineer, painter, writer. He had so many Masonic degrees that you could fill up five pages of a book with them. This guy was probably the most highly honored Mason in the world. And he began doing rituals to bring forth this crowned and conquering child. And he began to start what he called the cult of the fascinating child. And in doing this, he uncovered without knowing it the royal secret of Masonry. And what happened was, a gentleman came knocking at his door after he published a book. And in this book, he, it was a book of poetry, and in the book he had made an allusion to something. And this guy, named, his name was Theodore Royce. He was a German occultist and the head of the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis, which stands for the Order of Eastern Templars. There's the Knights Templar again. And this Theodore Royce told Crowley that he had given away the greatest secret in occult history. And Crowley said, what do you mean? I don't even understand it. So the guy promptly initiated him on the spot to the ninth degree of the OTO and then explained the secret to him. And you're about to learn what this secret is. The secret is that as a Mason, you are promised immortality. Where do they get their promise of immortality? 
Simply, the secret that Crowley uncovered, probably through demonic intervention, is the secret that this immortality is conveyed through tantric sex magic. And the kind of sex magic that is, we're talking about here, unfortunately, is a sexual violation of a little child. Crowley taught that the way you could live forever was by vampirizing little children sexually. Uh, and this, I apologize that this is so horrible, but, but Masons are doing this. Not all Masons, please understand me. Probably one in a hundred knows about this. But this is a significant enough problem that I feel compelled to share it with you. This is why the Masons believe that they will live forever. They think every time they defile a little child, they steal some of that child's youth. What happens then is they believe that they are accessing alternate universes, alternate realities where they can become as gods. Everything in magic, like everything in the occult, has its yin and yang. It's positive and it's negative. It's good and evil. There's always this dynamism. And so therefore, just like there is a tree of life, there is also a tree of evil. This is called the klephot in Hebrew, which translated means harlots. Here is what is ultimately involved. They, there is a belief that through this sexual perversion, they can access these tunnels into alternate universes, alternate realities. And the goal of this kind of magic is to find your own universe and become the god over that universe. This buys into the, to the modern day physics theory that there's many, many dimensions of reality. I, maybe you've read about that, alternate universes. It shows up in science fiction a lot. And, and then once you're the god of this universe, you can start sucking the energy out of it. And you can use that energy through this child to live forever and ever and ever. And there are men, I, I, I have met several that claim to be hundreds of years old. And this broad genre of magic is called, and here's a nice big word for you, transuguthian magic. And all that means is it's, it's magic that goes into trans-Plutonian space, space beyond the planet Pluto, which they believe is beyond the pale of the sun and therefore beyond the pale of the Judeo-Christian God. They believe there are gods out beyond Pluto that are far more powerful and far more dangerous and far more deadly than either God or the devil. And that's what these beings, these men, are trying to access. I mean, we're getting, this is such a problem that we are actually, I now know of five national support groups that are helping people that are survivors of Masonic ritual abuse. You come from generations of ritualistic uh, abuse? Um, yes, my family has an extensive family tree and they keep track of who's been involved and who hasn't been involved. And it's gone back to like 1700. And so you were... Right. Maybe. I was born into a family that believes in this. And, and this, is a, this is... Does everyone else think it's a nice Jewish family? From the outside, you appear to be a nice Jewish girl? Definitely. And you all are worshipping the devil inside the home? Right. There is other it? Jewish families across the country. It's not just my own family. Really? Well, when you were brought up in this, this kind of evilness, did you just think it was normal? Um, I've blocked out a lot of the memories I had um, because of my multiple personality disorder. But yes, I mean, it's like if you grow up with something, you think it's normal. Mm -hmm. I always thought... So what kinds of things? You don't have to give us the gory details, but what kinds of things went on in the family? Um, well, there would be rituals in which babies would be sacrificed and you would have to, you know... Who's babies? Um, there were people who um, bred babies in our family. No one would know about it. A lot of people were overweight, so you couldn't tell if they were pregnant or not. Or they would supposedly go away for a while and then come back. You witnessed the sacrifice? Right. Um, when I was very young, I was forced to participate in that, in which I had to sacrifice an infant. And the, the purpose of sacrifice is to what? Is to bring you what? What are you sacrificing for? For power. Uh-huh. Power. 
And so, were you you were ever used? Were you ever used yourself? Um, I was molested. I was mm -hmm. raped several times. Mm -hmm. um, and what's your mother doing? Um, she's in all of this. What's her role in all of this? What is? I'm not exactly what her role is. I haven't, you know, recovered all of my memories. But her family was extremely involved. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she brought me to it. Mm -hmm. Both of my parents brought me to it. And she's an outstanding citizen. Nobody would suspect her. Were you raised with a sense of right and wrong, Rachel? Yeah. I mean, it's like we, I had both. I mean, to the outside world, everything we did was proper and right. And then there were the nights that things changed, that things just got turned around. What was right was, what was wrong was right, and what was right was wrong. Um, there's a book that I had just come across called Lilith's Cave, which is a book of Jewish mysticism and um, supernatural. And there's a lot in that book that relates to what I, you know, endured when I was a child. I have joining me today Dr. and Rabbi Marvin Antelman. Welcome to the show, Rabbi. Thank you very much for having me here. First of all, let me say this. There are a lot of conspiracy theories out there. I'm not interested in theories. I'm interested in facts. So the scholarship over the years that I've utilized are sources that are impeccable. A man by the name of Shabbatai Tzvi, who was born in 1626 and died in 1676, came along and said, I am the Messiah. And he had a tremendous following. When it was realized that his following was so great, there would be problems, the sultan gave Shabbatai a choice. Either you die or convert to Islam. So he converted. Now, there were about a million followers prior to the conversion. When the conversion happened, then there was disillusionment among the Jews. But there were some diehard people who who set up different cults of Shabtai Tzvi. And the, the worst one of them was called the Dome, which was a secret organization. And the Dome was based in in Turkey and in Salonika, and the Dome gave rise to these terrible orgies that went on, which became part of the immorality theology of Shabtai Tzvi corrupted later on. He apostatized himself ten years before his death. So when he died in 1676, he had these, these cults doing all kinds of evil. And the reason that these these uh, followers of Shabtai Tzvi were doing evil was because what? Here's the thing. The Talmud says that the Messiah would come when everybody's good or everybody's bad. There is such a th saying in the Talmud. So they, the Sabadian said like this, it's impossible for everybody to be good. It's easy to be bad. So they turned around the Torah and they said, if you do an evil deed, then you will use up the energy of the of the universe and it'll collapse and you'll force Messiah to come because you will have used up all the evil in the world. So whenever they, they engage in an orgy they would make a bracha and every day they would figure out a way to, to do as many sins as possible. Like if you eat chalev, you're chay of karet. In other words, if you eat fat, according to the Torah, you're to be excommunicated from your people. So they would eat fat that was prohibited, non-kosher fat, from a kosher animal, which is chalev. Which, which is in that category, like eating blood from a from a kosher animal. So they would animal. do the opposite. They would do the opposite in <clears throat> order to hasten the the, the coming, coming of, of the Messiah. Messiah. After Shabtai Tzvi died, one of the most powerful Sabadian cults, as they were called, was a transformation of the Dome, the most extreme cult to Europe, through an insidious person by the name of Yaakov Frank, Jacob Frank. He died in 1791. Now the Frank has started to spread and take over entire communities and make them satanic. And you can actually trace a line historically, which I do in my book, to the CFR from Shabtai Tzvi, and another organization called the Illuminati, which was founded in 1776 by Adam Weishaupt. And uh, they were involved also in the French Revolution, which is also well documented. So what you're saying is that there really does exist a new world order, that it's not a conspiracy theory, it's a conspiracy. Right, and Professor Katz wrote a book called The Jews and Freemasonry, which 
gives a history of the interface between um, Jews and some of the cults that derived out of Shabtai Tzvi. But one, one of the, the next big cult that came from Shabtai Tzvi after the Dome organization, which was in Turkey, the next big cult were the Frankists, as I mentioned with Jacob Frank. So Jacob Frank, the Vat Arbor at the Council of Four Lands, wanted to deal with Frank, and they decided to have a, a big excommunication on the 20th of Sivan 250 years ago. And there they made the following rulings. They said everybody that is a Frankist is to be excommunicated. From the Jewish people. From the Jewish people, bastards to the 10th generation, is what it said. And uh, they prohibited people, because the Frankists were into Kabbalah, they prohibited the study of Kabbalah until you were 30 or 40 years old and you had a belly full, as they said, full of Talmud. Only then could you study the, the Kabbalah. Right. And uh, they said they're, they're women or whores, the, um, and they're hereby excommunicated from our people to the 10th generation. This is what the Council of, of uh, Four Lands, Lands at, labeled the Frankists, right. because they so deviated from Judaism and all that Judaism holds to be true and righteous. These people went off and made their basically their own uh, deformed, deformed religion, and so the Jews wanted nothing to do with them. They kicked them out. That is correct. Okay. Are there non-Jews that joined this Sabadian cult? No, non Jews did not join the Sabadian cult, but the non Jews did join the, um, the Illuminati. Police sources tell me this isn't the first time a sex party has taken place behind me. A claim that Freemasons I spoke to today deny. They say they do not stand for this. It's a secretive organization sitting right next door to the Battle Creek Police Department and the county courthouse. Police sources described to us an out-of-control sex party scene. Police sources told us the first officer to walk inside was shocked to find a couple performing a lewd sex act right in front of him, along with multiple nude women, drugs, and men videotaping it all behind these closed doors. Charlie told me Freemasons don't go on camera, and he didn't know about the multiple arrests that were made that night. He heard a rumor that night there was some nudity, and when he went to the facility at about 1 in the morning to check the party out, he didn't see anything wrong. Sometime after that, police arrived. He says this is not what they stand for. Hi, my name is David Scherter, and I have a website called davidscherter.com where I speak about my family's involvement in a satanic cult and child trafficking ring that happened here in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm getting ready to speak at the National Smart Conference in Hartford, Connecticut, the first weekend in August, information which can be found on the website ritualabuse.us. Anyway, yesterday, as a fluke, I decided to Google my own name, and after being dismayed at the horrid things that I found on the web, especially on a website called Web Sleuths, where I seem to be banned from making any comments, I have decided that perhaps I need to explain a few things about myself and what I am trying to achieve, and I'm going to do it on video. I wrote something because there's so much information that I can't get it all down in time. Anyway. First of all, one reason why some might find my website disjointed is because for all intents and purposes, I use it as a blog. I write what I want, when I want, and as you can tell by the entry dates, I am infrequent at best. The reason for this is that I have a life, and I find it unhealthy to focus on all of this. I am not bipolar, I am not schizophrenic, I don't suffer from manic depressive, I've never been multiple personality disorder. I do, however, have post-traumatic stress disorder, which is what I got from my childhood experiences, which is heavily triggered when I focus too heavily on my past. Contrary to what you might read on certain websites, I don't live in some dark corner hanging out on my computer every day. Uh, and although I may suffer from stress, I have a rich life, complete with a strong support system, a long and loving relationship, and a strong faith in God. The political involvement that I speak about concerning the Satanism that I experienced as a child is based on the fact that these issues aren't indicative of Omaha. Actually, these issues have presented themselves up and down California, Seattle, parts of Michigan, and Atlanta, which tells me that it has to do with government involvement looking at the scope of complaints, especially when you consider the lockdown that this country has been under for the past decade concerning any investigation or study into such allegations. It is safe to say that I, um, 
many have been fearful to even broach the subject for the fear of re the repercussions, which have a history of being quite severe. However, at this point, we have the advantage we didn't have before, and that is history. The fact that this nation went through what was deemed as a satanic panic is an undeniable fact of our nation's history. However, I believe that there is more involved than a bunch of hysterical parents, out of control therapists, and misguided, or misguided and misdirected children trying to take down their daycares. Based on my own personal experiences in Omaha, here are some of the reasons why. First, there is ex-Chief Police Robert Wadman, who is well documented in being involved in what happened here in Omaha. After leaving his post in Omaha, he eventually found himself in Wilmington, North Carolina, where, coincidentally, he found himself ensnared in the same types of allegations that he experienced in Omaha concerning cult activity and child abuse. Then there is Colonel Michael Aquino, founder of the ta Satanic sect Temple of Set, with a long esteemed history of military honors and personal friend of both Reagan and Bush. He was directly implicated by a mother of one of the um, abducted children in the area as being involved in son her son's disappearance. He has a long history of having to defend himself of allegations of child abuse, most notably for his involvement in the Presidio Daycare in San Francisco, where, again, he was accused of being involved in cult activity and child abuse. Of course, this could just be another coincidence. The last victim to come forward with allegations concerning what happened here in Omaha was a boy by the name of Brad Fugley, a good student, well-liked, and an activist in his school. He made a formal complaint against some of the people involved in his abuse to the Omaha Police Department. However, the next day he was found dead by an apparent suicide. This would have been completely forgotten had it not been for our current mayor, Jim Suttle. You see, his right-hand man and the one who helped him get elected also happened to be one of the men Brad Fugley made a formal complaint against. Barely mentioned in the news, but there nonetheless, it was explained that since the boy was dead, the complaint was dropped, and so it was quickly dismissed. Perhaps, again, it is a coincidence, but there seems to be an awful lot of them associated with this situation. Years ago, in a walking tour through Pedophile Omaha, I am unmistakably angry. But you have to understand how frustrating I found it to be that very few facts associated with what happened here in Omaha made sense. Three victim, the three victims associated with the events here could tell you about rooms in the White House, events in the Bohemian Grove, and hanging out with abducted children, but they didn't seem to know anything about their own hometown, not to mention the lawyers and politicians who were involved in investigating the events that surrounded a failed savings and, credit, or savings and loan called Fred Franklin Credit, which, made, which most of this revolves around. Considering how small Omaha is, and how much money was being made, not only on the child prostitution, but also on the drugs that Kevin Dobson was bringing in from the Contras. You're telling me that no one had any idea of what was going on here? I show how close all of this is to the police station, talking about the fact that Sam Soda, accused of being involved with the abduction of Johnny Gosh, worked right across the street as the manager of the stage door bar. I guess it's just a coincidence that all of this wasn't looked at. I have been criticized for not having physical proof of my family's activity, but again, you need to understand where I am coming from. The majority of my family is now dead. My dad, my oldest sister, my brother, and those still <coughs> alive who, are who were actively involved in my abuse, well, this is the thing. I am quite comfortable that they will never speak the truth of this. Given every opportunity to come clean, they will deny this till the very end. And as such, it will be something that they will take in their hearts with them the last minute they draw their last breath. Um, this is very important to me. You see, crazy as it may seem, I have this powerful faith based on the things that I was exposed to as a child. And I have discovered that what I want from all of this is not justice, but retribution. A retribution that can never be realized on this side. However, I believe that we are at a time of judgment and that those who are involved in this are about to be claimed by the same darkness they have brought in other people's lives. As such, I don't want to turn, do anything to turn them from the path that they have chosen. I want them to be claimed. My attention has shifted to the survivors, which there are many. The, UST, the USTRC no longer exists 
and my group is, that I am working with is no longer associated with Kathleen Sullivan. We are in the process of developing a survivor's project, which is why it has been delayed. And all of us are activists in our own right. Uh, um, we are all doing what we can to expose what has happened to us so that society is better informed. It is my involvement in this group that is taking precedence over my time and not this investigation into Omaha and my family. From what I have seen, there is too much money and political power behind what happened to here to prevent it from ever really being truly understood. And my time is better spent empowering survivors, which is why my website has changed the way it has. One last thing. I think it's really lame that there are places slandering me out there or printing libel um, and they don't have enough guts to come talk to me. You can reach me at davidscherter1 at gmail.com. Thanks. Bye. I'm Dave Reaver. For the next hour, we're going to be presenting to you on video some of the most bizarre and unbelievable things that we have ever presented through television efforts. In my lifetime, I've known some war, and in my lifetime, I have seen some of the bizarre. I've known suffering, but I've never known of the bizarre. I've never known of suffering like you're going to hear about in this video. And I certainly promise you this, it is war. I also think you should know that we accept responsibility for saying up front that what you're going to see and hear is terrifying. I do not want to be responsible for allowing children in the room who are not prepared for this. Parents, please pay careful attention and do as I ask. Please don't allow children to watch this video alone. Today, we are compelled to tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I've been out now for 14 years. I've only been able to laugh, and this is a serious statement. I've only been able to laugh out loud for about 10 years now. As people remember these experiences, they gag, they are nauseous, they, their, their entire body remembers what it was like to be there, to see this, to participate in this, to have this done to them. It's not a game. They really believe this. They believe Satan is on their side, and they will hurt you. The rituals that we went through are horrendous or horrifying to anyone on the outside that even dares dream that something like this could take place. The darkness of Satanism is spreading rapidly today, especially among young people. We see the graffiti symbols everywhere, the evil influences bearing down on teenagers, in the music, and in their lifestyles. The dimensions of this phenomenon have become alarming. In this Metroplex, uh, it's my estimate that there's approximately 40,000 practicing Satanists in the Metroplex. That does not include pagan organizations, druids, Wiccans, which are of the uh, right-hand path of witchcraft, not the left-hand path. Dabbling in the occult and its various aspects in this metroplex would have to be over 100,000 individuals. Now, that's a conservative estimate. It's not going on in the schools to hear them tell, you know, they're wearing blinders. It's hard to get them to realize it's going on. Some 
some te the teachers are more cooperative because they will call if they find notes or they hear something going on they will call us our department is getting more involved in the last eight or nine months because we've been getting calls from people that said we didn't know who to report these things to there was like seven or eight large dogs dobermans shepherds that had been killed and hung in a circle their heads cut blood drained and the guy said, well, that happened six months ago, but we didn't know who to report it to. 85% of the teenagers in high school in Western Europe have been exposed to hardcore Satanism. That's an unbelievable figure. Here in America, I do not believe those figures are that high, but I would venture to say that 40% uh, of the kids. Most teens involved in Satanism are dabblers. They wear the clothes, try a few rituals, and listen to the heavy metal bands. But some go further. Of these, the self-styled Satanists can be the most dangerous. Because they never join a cult, they are unpredictable and volatile. Sean Sellers murdered a store clerk for a thrill, then his own parents. Richard Ramirez, convicted as the night stalker killer, worked alone in the name of Satan. It took the jury 22 days to find Richard Ramirez guilty of all 13 murders and 30 related felonies he was charged with. Ramirez declined to be present for the verdict. Thus ended the year-long trial of the Texas drifter accused of being the Night Stalker, the serial killer who once terrorized Southern California. All but one of the brutal murders took place in the summer of 85. The killer was dubbed the Night Stalker because he broke into his victims' homes and attacked them while they slept shooting, stabbing, beating them to death. In some cases, wives were raped after their husbands had been murdered. Victims were robbed, survivors forced to swear to Satan, and sometimes pentagrams, symbols of devil worship, were left behind, scrawled as their bodies. Fear spread throughout Southern California as the death toll reached 13. I'm very upset. It's frightening and I'm scared. Everybody is real edgy. We have uh, diligently tried to lock all the doors and windows. Gun sales doubled. A hunt was launched for the man in the police sketch. And Richard Ramirez was finally captured by an angry mob in an East Los Angeles Hispanic neighborhood. Hell safe. In court, Ramirez was defiant. A guard said Ramirez posted pictures of a victim in his jail cell, declaring there is blood behind the Night Stalker. Defense attorneys said Ramirez was a victim of mistaken identity, but witnesses and fingerprints tied him to the murders and ultimately sealed his conviction. Now the court will decide the fate of Ramirez, whether he's sentenced to death or life in prison. The man known as the Night Stalker has been sentenced to death in California. Richard Ramirez was convicted of killing more than a dozen people in 1985. Ramirez got his nickname because he often entered victims' homes at night, murdering people as they slept. In court today, Ramirez read a twisted and rambling statement. You don't understand me. You are not expected to. You are not capable of it. I am beyond your experience. I am beyond good and evil. Legions of the night, night breed. Repeat not the errors of my father and show no mercy. I will be avenged. Lucifer dwells within us all. That's it. Today's sentence means Ramirez could die in the gas chamber for his crimes, but it carries an automatic appeal. Self-styled Satanists are volatile and frightening. But what of those who join organized cults and become what is called traditional Satanists? Teenagers recruited into these cults are told of the thrills and untapped power they can achieve through Satan, and they are promised drugs and sex. But do they know what really awaits them in the end? Once they get involved with this, they don't get out because they've taken part in so many criminal offenses uh, that if they can't just get up and walk away from it. The, they're, they're trapped by their actions and they're blackmailed into staying in. Another thing is that there's a good deal of... Uh, uh, power. It's an addiction. It's an addiction to evil. We all understand. Let's take it to the practical. For the public schools uh, teachers and, and counselors that are watching, they understand addiction. They understand how an addiction will move from marijuana to cocaine. Uh, in my own family, we watched an addiction in, in my second son move from marijuana into a $700 a day cocaine habit that nearly killed him. He was putting IV cocaine in his arm 15, every 15 minutes during the day. And 
he didn't just start that way. And these people are into an addiction as well. They start by reading the Satanic Bible, start by a little candle magic. They start by the Ouija board and getting in touch with the spirit. And they become addicted to the power. There are no motion pictures that have come out that truly show what happens. They don't show the terror that is in the priest's eyes and in his mind. They don't show that same terror in the high priestess, nor in the participants. The power that is derived there. I met with a witch the other day, a high priest of the Wiccan craft of the craft. And he found out who I had been. And he said, he said, I probably that's a problem I've got right now. He said, I he said, I don't have the power to go against people like who you were. He said, Lord, he said, you people could light bonfires and never walk up to it. And I said, that's right. And he said, you could kill me with a thought. And I said, no, with a word. Is that right? I mean yeah. That's the power that someone who has mastered, who has become an adept in the craft. Now, we're talking about a traditional Satanist, not a non-traditional idiot that is playing at this, but somebody that has made this their life's craft. Recently, Dave interviewed Dr. Bob Sloan, a psychologist who's dealing extensively with people trying to escape the terrible after effects of satanic involvement. Each sequence is drawn by a specific person, and I think the pictures illustrate the kinds of things we're talking about. Uh, the pictures are also drawn by the patient as they try to remember and try to recall what's happened. So drawing becomes a very important part of, of getting out and, and being able to firm up the puzzle that they're trying to put together. So they draw these pictures as a part of their recovery. As you can see here, there are certain steps that are followed. It's not a random kind of uh, thing that uh, they, they carry out on a whim. There are specific steps that they follow in preparing a small child to be initiated into the cult. They have to do this in this case because the child has been chosen. Oftentimes a baby is chosen for some reason to be the next leader of the clan. In this case, uh, there was a boy who was chosen and his mother, who herself was a child who was chosen when she was a baby, who is now grown up, now she's an adult, she has a son, she's preparing him. As you can see, the elements he's considered special and it's the, it's the combination, the introduction of pleasure and pain. Here you can see that she is introducing pleasure at the same time while she's doing that she's putting things, objects, uh, maybe a pencil, maybe, maybe a uh, heated nail or some other object that would create pain in him at the same time. As, the, as this awareness comes to her, she is in torment. As she, yeah, as she looks began, like she's tried to, to rub it out. Yes. There's, there's a part of her that said, I don't want to say this, I don't want to admit it. There's another part of her that says, yes, it's the truth, I have done it. How could I? I'm so bad, I'm so evil. My um, night of baptism and initiation, I was initiated by fire, both physically and spiritual fire. And the spiritual fire is, they summoned a demon forth and it entered my body and set me on fire from the inside out that I might know discipline and the power of the covenant. And um, I've done it myself to other people. There are horrors that are unmentionables. That's why I say motion pictures can't hold a candle to it. If you will, imagine the young man that was taken off the streets of Matamoros. He would have been mutilated slowly, that his life force not leave him quickly, but slowly as to increase the frenzy of the sorcerer committing the act. So the greater the pain, the greater the suffering, the greater cries that he gave out, the greater the power derived from his life force leaving his body. That's the belief. Some of Dr. Sloan's patients also speak of the terrors of Satanism. These pictures were drawn by adults remembering things they had long ago repressed 
things done to them as children when they had been forced to take part in cult rituals. The following is but one example of a satanic sacrifice. This is a, a, a typical kind of ritual uh, which involves the kidnapping of children. And uh, in this case, you can see this ritual ceremony took place in a barn here, are the bales of hay. It's an old barn. And in this case, you can see the, the cauldron, the boiling cauldron, the altar, the gold knives, all the elements are here, the, the robed members of the cult. Uh, in this case, the victim is a child, four or five years old, and uh, the, the cult victim who drew this picture was still a child. And the sacrificial victims were, in this case, two, a brother and a sister who had been kidnapped, and uh, they had been seduced. And at this point, she reports that they weren't really scared. They'd probably been taken off of a playground somewhere and said, we're going to go have a birthday party or something. So they weren't scared. They're brought in ages uh, about seven. You can see the cult leader here. Um, these children are tied onto the altar. And there's also the beginning of bloodletting. So they've cut the boy some. He's starting to cry, and she's crying, because they, they realize now what's happening, of course, and there's screaming. It, it starts to happen. Um, the member of the cult, the child member of the cult, of course, is watching she's very scared she's reporting and she's remembering that they made her do this and how bad she feels about it but she can't help it she's four these are adults she's a victim in this process uh, as this ritual proceeds you can see that there begins to be a lot of blood uh, you can see that the the boy here is then cut open again along his chest ripped apart, his organs taken out, and then he's dismembered. You can also notice that the little girl has lots of little cuts and she's bleeding pretty profusely here from her groin area. So there's beginning to be a lot of screaming, a lot of blood, uh, dismemberment and preparation for uh, the cannibalism. You can also pick up in this drawing the worship nature of this. Right. This is not just an event, this is a a worship service that builds to a frenzy, builds up to a peak. Um, and this, of course, is, as sh this person wrote here, preparation for the human stew. Here, the brother is dismembered. He's already gone. He's in the stew. And the, the child, a uh, member of the, the cult, then herself is uh, brought up to participate more. The adult leader is cutting the, the little girl and killing her ultimately as the, the child the member um, inserts other objects into the little girl. The element that's not really seen here but written in is the uh, sexual abuse that always precedes the bloodletting. The members of the cult all sexually abuse. Um, the victims before the torture and the mutilation. This begins. is where the power of pornography in our society begins to play its role. Is it's the introduction of the bizarre, that that pornography begins to be a a venting and a letting of urges, and once it starts, it's never satisfied. And pornography is just the introduction. It's the little door to open to the mind. Well, pornography, of course, is an addiction, and pornography sexual stimulation, it stimulates the same part of the brain, the pleasure center that cocaine stimulates. It's addictive. Um, and, of course, sexual stimulation and the unfettered expression of sexual fantasy is a part of all no, of this. Absolutely not. Anything goes. The, as you know, the satanic theology is the reverse of Christian theology. Love is bad. Uh -huh. Life is, is bad. Hate is good. Death is good. So there's the kind of the, the breaking down of any limits on fantasy and imagination and what the theology of Satanism does is uh, says no holds barred and evil is good. expressed. Evil is good, that's, their, that's right. their role. There are scores of painful stories like these from people who have lived a hellish nightmare. One of Dr. Sloan's patients tells of having to watch an actual crucifixion conducted at Easter time when coven leaders kidnapped a young man, nailed him to a cross, mutilated him, branded him with irons, and then threw him alive into their bonfire. 
One victim tells of being forced to help in a torture and sacrifice of his own mother. I've been out now for 14 years. I've only been able to laugh, and this is a serious statement. I've only been able to laugh out loud for about 10 years now. And I'm gradually getting better about being able to laugh and have joy in my life because I hurt inside a great deal. Uh, many times I think about things that I did and what I have done to other human beings. This is not a pleasant thing at all. It's very disturbing. I know that the Lord has forgiven me and my problem is, is can I forgive me? And I know that I have to and that's the fact that I live with. I do and I'm getting better at it. And I have a wonderful, wonderful wife right now who's very loving and very understanding and who has a deep understanding of the occult and Satanism from what I have taught her, but an understanding from the viewpoint that a Christian should take towards it, a caring, a loving attitude. I mean, if it wasn't for that, I don't know exactly how I would deal with it today. You know, for years, police officers have had to deal with kids getting hooked on drugs and going bad over a period of uh, a relatively short period in the life of a child, maybe uh, three to six months, something like that. A kid can go from being a straight A student to being a um, absolute uh, disgrace. And uh, what we find in occult groups are that a child can go from being uh, perfectly normal, well adapted, uh, well thought of, to being a total um, waste in, in a shorter period of time as a month and so frequently when we get involved in these things it's because they have gone off the deep end in such a short period of time. Have you seen some of these people come out of this? What are you seeing with some of these people now? Where are they in their development? We're seeing people uh, in the process of uh, we've seen a real spiritual sensitivity with these people. Uh, they know there's a spirit world. They're very sensitive to that. And they, because they're with us, they've committed themselves to, uh, to healing and uh, a change in their life. It's a long, torturous process. It is not a quick fix. How can you do this to a child? A few people that have tried to pull themselves out of a group like this are traditionally females who are tired of giving up their children for sacrifice, something like that. But traditionally, the men don't get out very often. Uh, we do see uh, situations where the uh, kids get in, but because of free sex and drugs and the power and so forth, they ended up getting in over their head, and then they can't uh, pull themselves out either. Dr. Bashir Ahmed is a psychiatrist dealing extensively with young people caught in Satanism. Here he gives a profile of the typical recruit. The kids who have difficulty at home, who are coming from dysfunctional families, where the bond between parents and children almost non-existence, these children are easily lured to the fantasy world, which they like it. They most probably like to read about magic stories, fantasies, and they begin to live in this world. And when they see an opportunity to experiment something like this, they become very impressed. For example, uh, for a 13-year-old going at midnight to a cemetery, it's a lot of excitement. Uh, his heart is beating very fast. He doesn't know what is going to happen. Um, he has some fear. A non-traditional Satanist uh, stem from anyone who might have a low self-esteem about themselves, someone that is an underachiever, is not an overachiever, someone who is not charismatic in their attitude. Most normally a child that is been turned off by school, been turned off by his friends. Satanists will approach him and they'll woo him in because they will become his best friend. And after they get him, he's hooked. Satan is at his most deceptive when he appears to be good. Such is the case with many of the occult practices in southern Louisiana. There, the tree tours, as they are called, are famous for their peculiar blend of magic, potions, folk remedies, and diluted elements of Roman Catholicism. 
We visited one tree tour who tried to explain some of his rather confused methods. The power is written in the Bible. The verses of the Bible has been given, and uh, no matter where you take, what part you take in the Bible, Jesus said that he he's given power to all. These candles are for if somebody sad, somebody have tears, and they keep hearing things in their home. The spirit is not resting. And it's very simple to, to cure someone with epilepsy. Somebody that falls in this in a, in these kind of fit, take your little needle, a needle, and hold his finger and just stick it just enough to draw blood, not stick it all the way we hit bone, just enough to break the skin. Take a little bit of that his blood and put a little sugar in water and make him drink of his own blood. Just a little bit, about nine drops of blood. New Orleans, bustling city on the Mississippi with a rich and colorful history. Famous for its lively French Quarter, jazz, unique dining, and voodoo. Though most voodoo practitioners live in the swampy backwaters of lower Louisiana, some have set up shop in the French Quarter. One of the most famous voodoo houses is owned by Chicken Man, who recently granted us an interview. He turned out to be more promoter than magician. Why do they call you the Chicken Man? Well, I'm the voodoo king of New Orleans, and uh, I do my, my voodoo rituals out in the bayou on my island. I use live chickens and live snakes. What kind of rituals do you do, or what is it supposed to do? Well, my rituals is uh, mainly I do those for healing and, and uh, helping people, not hurting. That's the main purpose. And um, I do a lot of it, use a lot of it for uh, keeping the kids off of drugs. You know, drugs is getting real bad now. Well, what kind of rituals do you do for drugs or that? Explain just some of the rituals a little bit. Well, I get pieces of seeds from the, from the bayou. And at night, we do our rituals put all the seeds in a, lot, in, a, in a big circle. And while the drums are playing, we put energy into those seeds. And uh, I pass them out to the kids to carry in their pocket. And when they, they think about going on drugs, they, they put that seed in their hand. Not all Louisiana tree tours stay with the good magic, however. Ferenberg, a pastor who continually confronts their oft-feared work, explains black magic. I have a man in the church right now that when he first thought he coming, this man was blackmailing him that if he didn't pay him so much a month that he was going to put hex and voodoo on him. And this man was in such fear that I literally had to tell this man to tell that man if he did it again, I was going to the DA's office. That's what I'm saying. If the people stand up and let these people know that they're, not, they're going to be exposed, this man quit blackmailing this guy when I threatened to go to the DA with it. Law enforcement officials are just now beginning to learn about cult crime and how to investigate satanic rituals. The slaughter in Matamortis helped to awaken the nation to a growing nightmare. Matamortis is not finished. It's the beginning. It's the tip of a very, very large iceberg. And we're going to hear more of Matamortis. And the lady that was um, taken into custody who she claims that she had no foreknowledge of these events and did not participate, I would venture to say she fits the exact profile of being the high priestess of this cult, as well as being the one in complete authority and in charge, not the godfather. He was under her direct command. I think that our authorities here in the state of Texas have somewhat downplayed and may have missed the boat with her. The Mexican authorities have not missed the boat. They have her keyed in exactly who she is. And it's up to the authorities here to listen to them, pay attention to what they're saying. One Mexico authority down there uh, stated that she exhibited three distinct personalities, one of which is this kind, uh, sweetheart, all-American girl attitude. Another one of that she exhibited is one that growls and bites and kicks and spits. Uh, she exhibits a third one that exhibits tremendous authority and power. That's why I say she probably is. She exhibits the type of uh, personality, uh, the type of demeanor and so forth of uh, an individual that would be in power. People don't want to believe the unbelievable. 
Vicki Caldwell has been investigating cult crimes for the sheriff's office in Putnam County, Florida, and during the past few months has noticed an increase in activity among satanic groups. I got arrested about four years ago because a friend of mine up in Ohio, her son got involved and he tried to kill himself and kill his parents. And so I've been studying it since I came with the department. It's been about a year and a half. I have noticed an increase around here with the teenagers. What kind of things do you see? Uh, most of your self-styled Satanists, your dabblers, drugs, heavy metal music, role-playing games, animal mutilations. In August of 1986, we had a double murder in which two teenage Parkers were found shot quite a number of times mm -hmm. in a rural parking lot of a uh, development which was going up. Uh, at the time of that investigation, we became acquainted with a term called Dungeons and Dragons, and as part of that investigation, we got involved in some of the occult investigations also. Well, part of the problem, number one, they understanding what they're up against. Uh, they have pagans, witches, traditional and non-traditional Satanists, as well as uh, skaters. They have uh, skinheads, freaks, pops. They've got everything under the sun that they're not truly understanding the relationships between each and every one of them, as well as which are criminal and which are not criminal. Who's violent, who is not? Who can be expected to turn violent? Uh, someone necessarily calling themselves a Satanist isn't necessarily so. It's a, it's a new era for law enforcement, just like when drugs started, it was new. Computer crime is new. People are starting now to realize that there is something else out there. A lot of cases are being reopened because of that. Well, I've been a police officer for 15 years, and probably during that entire 15 years, I have seen things which we now label as ritualistic in nature, but never recognized it. One young woman's body was found, what appeared to be a brutal rape case that culminated in the stabbing of the victim, was left by law enforcement agencies that way, with no further clues. However, upon her chest was Z-E-N across her chest in her own blood. It made no sense to them. It made no sense because they're not Satanist. That Z-E-N is the name of a demon, and his name is not Zen, by the way. It is Zod-N, Zod-N. And that demonic entity is who she was sacrificed to, and had they known that, it would have led them in the direction of searching for a Satanist. The most frightening fact of all is that Satanists today have encroached into every level of society, a dangerous and unseen force. Lawyers, politicians, uh, police officers, and this is just very shocking at how many police officers, how many officials are actually practicing Satanist. And this is one of the other problems that we have in dealing with the crimes, that the crimes themselves are snuffed out. They're, they're hushed up. Or if a crime is known to be in progress, it's very difficult to get anybody to respond to it because of things that are blocked within the judicial system. By Satanists? By Satanists. These people are in every strat of society. We're talking doctors, we're talking lawyers, we're talking a lot of Christian ministers who preach a sermon perhaps on Sunday morning and are involved in satanic rituals the night before. We're talking elders and, uh, and Sunday school superintendents. I, I'm, I'm mentioning the cases that I am aware of. Uh, and as you, you've studied this yourself and read the literature, you know that uh, people at every level and every profession, uh, successful business people, uh, psychologists, doctors, law enforcement people uh, are involved in this kind of thing. It's, uh, it's unnerving. We've had notes written about uh, Satan on walls in schools. You know, that my God's better than your God and all this. We had one note, you're welcome to a bloodbath ritual. Uh, be there at 11.54 for the, so for the gatekeeper of hell to appear. Bring your set clothes or black sheets. This is what's going on in basically the schools. Usually, it's very secretive. As far as the kids go, you know, they don't know anything, they haven't done anything. Parents usually think, my kid just going through a, you know, a phase.
In the beginning, Satanists will entice a recruit with these three promises, power, drugs, and sex. Most teenagers recruited into Satanism are boys, drawn by the violent images and rituals, and by the fear they can cause in others. Yet without heavy involvement in drugs, most of these recruits would not be able to go on. Most of the time, like I said, there's drugs involved. Just because you're taking drugs does not necessarily mean you're into Satanism. But nine times out of ten, Satanists are into drugs. I have not seen in my practice any uh, adolescent who have gone to the cult activity without using drugs. As a non-traditionalist begins to get deeper into drugs and more and more deeper into his known craft and seeking after the powers, he loses sight of reality completely. You're no longer dealing with human beings as you and I know them. Yvonne Peterson tells this tragic story of one girl who committed a heinous crime in the name of Satan. And I think parents need to hear this, that uh, she needed somebody to talk to and her parents were too busy. She was the oldest of six and she was their babysitter, their dishwasher and their house cleaner. And they didn't have time for her. I'm going to call her Diane for the book, okay? And uh, that's not a real name, but she was a very intelligent, pretty a little girl of 12 years old, she went to a party and she met a young man, which we'll, we'll call him Steve, okay? He's 16. And Steve told her he would listen to her and he would pay attention. Now, this is, this is not fiction. And this isn't something I read in a book. I sat with this little girl as she cried her eyes out, as she walked through the memories of the past two years, uh, the things that she had had done to her and had had to do to other people. Uh, he told her, I'll listen to you. And he gave her a marijuana cigarette. And they went outside and sat under the tree and they talked. And then he began to tell her how, how pretty she was and how much he needed to be around her and how fascinating she was. And all he did was, it was show love and attention, which every teenager in America craves from their parents. And, and so if they're not did. there, then those Satan, well, the average age, the average time a father spends with his kids is three minutes a day. That's sad. Three minutes a day. That's incredible. And, uh, so he told her, I'll, I'll, Steve told Diane, I'll take care of you, you know, we'll be boyfriend, girlfriend. And they developed their relationship over the next six months. He also developed her drug habit because now she was hooked on cocaine. Okay, at the end of the six months, he told her that he was a Satanist priest and that she was being recruited and that she would be initiated into his coven of, of Satanists. She kept a diary. At one point, she said, where has that innocent child gone? Will I ever know her again? Speaking of herself, her tragic notes all throughout her diary, both of her spiritual bondage and her physical bondage to the addiction. And she said she would lay in bed at night and she would hear them chanting and calling her back to the circle. And then on August the 1st, three years ago, she was led into a cemetery. And if I might have your permission, I'd like to read from her hand the memories of that night. Uh, please do. I found out that we were having our cult ceremony in the cemetery. That wasn't as shocking as when I found out that Steve and me were going to be married into the cult. Anyway, it was fantastic. The moon was perfectly round and it wasn't even cold. By the black candles, which were primarily used for light, we went through the ceremony of eternal slavery to each other. We cut our tongues and we let the blood pour into each other's mouths. It was nirvana. We were one, one blood, one being. Rosalie passed the sacred vial around and we performed the ritual of extending ourselves. Bright colors and lightning flashed streaks through the sky. Sometimes the colors exploded like rockets on the 4th of July, both in and out of our head. When the chanting started, they brought in a little baby. He was barely walking, tied him to a nearby tomb. It was crying. After it was tied down, Chris took out his sacrificial dagger. I held back the baby's head while he cut it from the base of its neck down to its waistline and across the stomach. The baby was still alive, so I broke its neck by just about twisting it off. I hate myself so bad now. I helped in the killing of a baby. Animals made me sick enough and made me feel quite horrible. But a baby, my God. That was someone's child. I know now that I am truly horrible. No punishment I have ever had in the past could even begin to measure the type of punishment I need. I wish it could have been me they killed. My life isn't worth anything anymore. 
I've taken away someone's right to live. She's 14. And I mainlined with Satan uh, when I was 21 years of age. And I came out at age 28, but I was a Satanist high priest for four years. Now, during that particular time period, I remember very little as far as details are concerned. I don't remember even graduating from high school, although I know I did. Why don't I remember it is the fact that drugs were involved and the need to escape, the need a person has to have to escape the realities of what they have been involved in. And I took what I called clean drugs. They were pharmaceuticals. Not that it really matters any, but I was hooked on Percodan, Valiums, Librium, and just plain alcohol. I would take an average of uh, 60 to 80 milligrams of Valium in a day's time with about 40 milligrams of Percodan and wash it all down that night with two or three vodka Collins. It was a functional addict. Drugs, sex, power. These are the enticements Satanists use to lure teenagers. Another is music, specifically heavy metal or black metal. I think music has always been a powerful media all the way through. I mean, music was important to you and me, and, and it's important to the teenagers today. And we're not anti-heavy metal, but we're anti the heavy metal message that is causing death and destruction. And the symbols that they're using are so blatantly occultic uh, that it's very difficult for us to overlook that kind of thing. For instance, if we take uh, the album uh, cover from Slayer's album, Rain and Blood, uh, it depicts a message to young people that maybe consciously they don't receive, but subconsciously they're receiving this message. On the front of this album cover, uh, Satan is depicted as a goat, which is very familiar to the Satanists. They know that that would be the goat would represent Satan and he is seated on a wooden throne and the throne is being supported by two people now in the hand of this goat is a decapitated head and of course we're finding decapitated bodies all over America and um, that is a common way for a Satanist ritual to occur is to do the decapitation and so he's holding this decapitated head which emphasizes the bloodletting ritual and the murder and then the throne is, is lifted up and being carried on the shoulders of two men. The man in the foreground is wearing a mitered hat, which we know to be the hat of a pope. And so that man represents organized religion or the church. Behind him is another man who is carrying the throne of Satan, not only on his shoulders, but across his neck, like the stalks would have him in bondage. And that man has horns and a forked tongue. And when you look at that, you think, oh, this is one of Satan's demons. And yet, if you look carefully, his hands are very prominent in the picture, and they have nail marks in them. And the only man depicted throughout history with nail marks is Jesus Christ. And so what this thing is saying to them is that Christ and the church will support the rise and of Satanism and in addition to that, then there's the sea of blood that is flowing into a huge sea below Satan. That all the faces are down in the sea that he has taken captive and, and have become his victim. And the very for the, in the forefront there is a face that if you take that face and put it up against the face of George Washington, you'll see that they're almost the same. I mean, they're so identical. And so what we're saying here is that Satanism is going to take over our country and that it is going to be brought in and supported by Christ himself and the organized church. That is blatant uh, evangelization and propaganda being, sh being shared with uh, thousands of young people through music. I think the greatest tool to desensitize America has been uh, media in general, whether it is television, whether it's toys, games, or whether it is music, they all have played an important part. They all carry a message, don't they? Absolutely. And of course, in the life of the teenager, the two single most factors that we see um, is music and a game called Dungeons and Dragons. And then, of course, trailing very closely behind that and vying for the position is the amount of occult information that is put out through um, the videos, the movies, the TV shows. We went into a very small store, David. This was, I mean, maybe 
as big as we're sitting here. This was a small set. We found 119 videos on the occult in one small store. And we have a video in America that is on our shelves that has been banned in 46 countries. And it was so popular, it has faces of being one, two, three, and four. And in that video, it shows everything that is gruesome, grotesque, everything that you would never want to see or hope your child would never see in the way of death scenes, including some decapitation occult rituals. Parents should be alert to the warning signs that show their kids are involved in the cults. Besides the music, there are the clothing, jewelry, and symbols used. There is the classic pentagram, worn inverted by the Satanist, the broken cross or peace sign, the inverted cross, the horn hand sign, the goat's head, the 666 sign, and many others. In addition to symbols, watch for involvement in occult games like the Ouija board or in dark role-playing games. I would tell them, especially the parents with the young people, this is not a phase. Know what your young people are, are doing. Talk to your young people. Communicate. Don't fluff it off. Check everything. There's nothing wrong with asking them where they're going, what they're doing. There's nothing wrong with checking out their music and books they're reading. The parents need to care and communicate. Satanists entrap young people in several ways. At sex parties, they take snapshots of their victims for use of blackmail, or they'll involve the unsuspecting victim in their darkest rituals, perhaps animal or human sacrifice. They will get the teenager to offer his blood or even a finger to Satan. Blackmail and even outright threats keep a teenage victim in line. Some victims see suicide as their only escape the tragic legacy of Satanism. The message I like to give to parents is that be close to the children. Understand them, talk to them, communicate with them. Uh, always find a time where you will make a point to go to in their room or sitting in the living room and talk about their school, their friends. 10 to 15 minutes each day is more than enough. Although Everybody will surprise 10, 15 minutes, that's all you're asking? Yes, because they don't talk even five minutes in weeks. So 10 to 15 minutes, that's first thing. Second thing is that at least once in a month, try to have a family gathering, not extended family, just three, four children, have a picnic or go out somewhere, half an hour, one hour. It gives them a feeling of belonging, a relationship. In addition to the personal involvement parents can have in their kids' lives, people can also work against Satanism at the community level. Many schools and organizations now offer seminars on Satanism. Some communities have gone even farther than that. Recruitment is a major part of Satanism, but it's one of the most instantly denied things. By... And yet it's such a problem that even on our public school campuses, now school boards are having to take direct action against it. I'm reading from the Carl Sandburg High School 1989-1990 Student Parent Handbook. On page 29, it deals with policy, and I want you to hear this. The Board of Education hereby finds that the presence of Satanism and related activities has surfaced in society and that such practices, when present or urged upon other students, cause material interference within a public high school district in that such practices foster anti-social values and attitudes and endangers the health, safety, and welfare of students. Carl Sandburg High School is the number three school academically in the United States. It's in Chicago. Now listen, no student shall engage in any Satanism-related uh, activity, including, but not limited to the following. Number one, soliciting others for membership in any satanic group or participation in any satanic related ritual or practice inciting other students to act with physical violence upon any other person or living thing thirdly they are not permitted to wear use distribute display or sell any clothing jewelry emblem badge sign or other item which is commonly associated with the affiliation with or practice of satanism what I'm trying to say to you is, these three areas of recruitment, 
high school campuses, military bases, daycare centers. I'm most obviously connected with, first, the high school campus, and then secondly, the military base. My point, though, is that so much activity is now taking place that school boards are having to enact policies in how to deal with it. This isn't relegated to the big city of Chicago only. Here's something you should see from a town in our community, Arlington, Texas. Well, this Halloween, you might see a scarecrow in the halls of Arlington schools, but you won't see kids wearing scary costumes. The school district is banning skulls, witches, brooms, and the like because of parent concerns that some Halloween costumes can be linked to devil worship and satanic cults. Channel 4's Ken Caps has more on that story. Playful screams on Arlington playgrounds mean back to school and recess. But there won't be any shrieks or screams by these kids clothed in goblin garb this Halloween. Ghosts and skeletons and other scary characters are expelled. And when you see children in elementary levels coming with Freddy Krueger and their fingers have the knives or whatever he has and the grossness of the costumes, we thought we can do better than that. Atherton principal Shirley Cole has her kids decorating a school display area with pressed leaves and a stuffed scarecrow. Autumn, not Halloween, will be emphasized. Kids in Arlington will still dress up on October 31st, but they'll be playing the parts of their favorite book characters. October is book month. Which will do two things. It'll give those children an opportunity to dress in costume, but it also will encourage them to read. Satan exacts an agonizing toll in the lives of those who are trapped and in the lives of those who help them escape. Yet those we have interviewed expressed a profound hope for those who want to escape. If you have your rehabilitation and your counselors, but it's going to take something stronger in some of these cases. And a good old-fashioned prayer meeting won't hurt anything. There's hope for me. There's hope for everyone. I don't care what the situation. So the number one importance is the cohesive relationship among the family members. In the kid who has some belief in God, I think he's much more protected. Because there's a God and because there's a cross, there's hope. And that's not a second-handed uh, hope. I had a choice to make, and I chose life. I knew I was about to die and that I was going to hell. What the Satanist is looking for in, in the long term, he's looking for God. He's looking for that thing that he can worship. And until he finds it, until he gets reconciliation with what he's looking for, then there is no freedom. Recently, my brother asked me the question, he said, where was Satanism when we were kids? Why didn't we get into it? Why didn't we know about it? It really is a more recent phenomenon on the social life of the students and the kids of America. In looking at what you have just seen, consider it. Remember what's been said. Remember the people. They're everyday people. Many of those people never intended to ever be sitting on a television stage or set and talk about Satanism. We've done our best in researching these people to qualify both their character and their claims. We believe in them, that they've been honest with you and with us. I've asked my brother to join me and give a few of his thoughts on what he's seen. A man I hold in great esteem. He's general manager of this corporation, and when we went into this thing together, we didn't go into it foolishly or with some kind of entertainment in mind. We went in with a cause. Al Reaver, Thank I'm you, glad you're with me. <clears throat> Actually, I went into this, my part of it with fear and trembling because there's a fine between glorifying something that you really are only trying to give information on and, uh, and just giving information. And I, I feel like that our television department has done a good job in, in staying on the right side of that line. I'm sure that there are some who have watched the video and they have a question in the back of their mind and they're saying to themselves, does this prove the existence of Satan? Well, see, we're not, a, well, that's not the question that we were approaching. That's not what we were trying to do. We weren't trying to prove anything. Yeah. What we were trying to do and I feel have accomplished is we have shown that Satanism is very real. The consequences of Satanism 
are very real. There are really hurting people because of the presence and the activities of Satanism. Now, where a person goes with that is something that they're going to have to deal with internally. They're going to have to ask themselves some very serious questions. But the signs, the evidences, the things that are going on around, and especially on high school campuses, things that I've seen where normally I, I just drive onto a school campus, you know, and let my teenager out and drive off. The other day I drove onto the campus and I looked over and under a tree was a large group of young people, all of them, every single one of them dressed in black. And I thought, there's no reason for that unless, you know, and then it clicked. There's probably something going on. Did you know, Dave, I watched it over a period of days, and one day as I drove by, I saw two boys there fighting. Everybody just standing there looking, just grinning. And, and when I say fighting, I don't mean just kind of hugging and rolling around in the dirt. One of them was holding the other one's jacket over his head and was kicking him in the stomach. It was, it was vicious, it was cruel, and it went exactly in line. I slowed down, almost came to a stop to see if there was anything to do, and he let the boy go, and the boy took off running. But just to see and know what is happening on our high school campuses ought to put the fear into people and enough to start to take some action. Well, our campuses are beginning to be more violent than they've ever been. There's more at stake than there's ever been. Uh, I think today we have, through this video, shared with you what we see as the trends, some consequences. I don't think we're prepared for it in America. We don't have all the answers. I don't know if we gave you enough answers to really help, but at least we have tried to do something to bring an awareness of what many people, especially those on the fringes of Satanism, are denying exists. They're saying there is no such thing. Ask those families of 15 dead people in Matamoros. Ask the families of the Night Stalkers victims. It's very real. Are you prepared for it? I'm Dave Reaver. Thank you for being part of this program today. Pretty young girl in a strange new world of power and deceit. All the sex and highs of controlling life seem so exciting. But now she's one month two with the baby boy and they are telling her the truth. That the purest secret of the revised is the child. Victims 
one a boy as young as six. Over the course of the trial, those victims gave harrowing accounts of what happened to them. And it was those victims coming forward, Jim, that brought, uh, brought this cult down in the end. What all of them said was that it was the group's occult beliefs and occult practices that was used to justify what was being done to them, in particular, uh, the Book of the Law. Uh, a text by the occult writer that you mentioned, Anster Crowley. Now, uh, as I say, he was born in the 1870s and, and lived through to the 1940s and was a pretty infamous figure. I mean, what, what were the sort of ideas, if we can call them that, were, that were adopted by Batley and his, uh, well, the people who turned out to be his co-defendants in this case? Uh, well, Jim, when the police searched the homes of Batley and all the other cult members, they found laminated copies uh, of Crowley's text in each of, the, in each of their homes. Uh, prosecutors in this case highlighted sections of his writings, which they said stated that sex with anyone uh, was to be encouraged, as was rape. And they said that this group, and in particular Batley, put that idea into practice. And uh, they said it also helped Batley establish his authority over the other cult members and intimidate his victims. Uh, those victims spoke of feeling brainwashed by Batley and said that he threatened them with punishments derived from uh, those occult beliefs, threats that at the time to them seemed credible. Uh, but it was just one of the ideas of the occult with which this group was obviously obsessed. The women uh, all had matching tattoos with Egyptian-style iconography, uh, and the group would also uh, hold ri uh, occult rituals where the uh, abuse of these victims would often take place. Just a quick one finally, Tom. I mean, what has been the reaction to the revelations in Kidwelly and the area in West Wales where all this occurred? Well, well, understandably, Jim, there's a sense of shock there. You know, what else could there be uh, at something so horrendous happening in their midst and over such a long period of time as well? The people there have spoken to me about wanting to move on from this. Uh, easier said than done, perhaps. The real fear there, though, is that Kidwelly, which is um, an otherwise fairly unremarkable, if pleasant enough, provincial town, uh, it will become synonymous with this cult and the awful, awful things that they've done. Uh, Tom Singleton, uh, thank you very much indeed. You've been following this case. We can have a word with Paul Newman, who's a biographer of Alistair Crowley. A lot of people, uh, Paul Newman, will know the name and they, they might know the sobriquet, the beast, and so on. Uh, just remind us what his, his power was over those who followed him. Um, well, he was born uh, in 1875. He was a Victorian, and his parents were Plymouth Brethren, who were very strict, and so he knew the Bible almost off by heart. And he identified with the Antichrist figure, and he saw that the one sin was restriction. And of course, in Victorian England, it was in the area of sexual behaviour where people felt most restricted. So that's what he, he recoiled against? Well, mostly. yes, and he thought that sexual health was necessary, you should express yourself, and the body was sort of self-regulating. What he didn't allow for is limitary lines and boundaries, and of course, any advocate of sexual freedom, I and mean, he wasn't the only one, um, D.H. Lawrence, mm. Um, Bertrand Russell tried to, all this point, you all always come up against this. And so, you know, it's the same problem, very active today, because um, sex has many kind of ugly heads. And the idea probably that, that, that it'll find a natural balance, no doubt some people, it will in some people, but it, it, sometimes it masters the personality and um, ends mean, up in he, dreadful cases like what you've mentioned. Indeed. And what's interesting about Crowley is that he has become, and no doubt still does, and judging by this case, um, an obsessive figure for people. I mean, they become uh, absolutely riveted by, by his peculiarities, by his dominating personal, personality, by his weirdness, by everything about him. Yes, well, I think when you find very unorthodox people, they tell you about the orthodoxy of society, and often you can study the social dynamics through eccentrics. And, of course... Um, Crowley shocked in many ways. Sometimes he was a kind of playful figure who was colourfully dressing up. Sometimes he was a mountaineer and explorer. So he was a trickster and he had many faces. He probably did not intend to um, willfully destroy people's lives, but he was like a, a supernova personality, a big, powerful, slightly kind of bloated influence who would draw smaller planets in and sometimes burn them up. He had intelligence and ability and he had a certain social standing, but he could be very dangerous to weaker people who were drawn into his to becoming disciples. Wiccan witchcraft are idolatrous, pagan and satanic and pure spiritual poison. So I refer people to the information in the description box.
That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Today, it was an historic day for our nation's elected leaders as they put party differences aside to pray for our country. CBN News welcomes Senator Sam Brownback, who shares his thoughts on the lasting impact the National Day of Reconciliation may have on our country. It's called a spell book, and it's it like it has a picture of Harry Potter, and then you like type in stuff, and it's really cool. You can just sort of like yeah, you can your type own. in the spell. You can just what you want to do. As a book series, its success is downright supernatural, selling more than 100 million copies worldwide. As a movie, it's smashing records and captivating kids of all ages. CBN News explores the mystery behind Harry Potter mania. Today on this edition of the 700 Club. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. I'm Pat Robertson. Well, let's go over to Terry with the next feature on the program. Well, the new Harry Potter movie grossed nearly $200 million in the first two weeks after its release. It seems just about everyone is reading the Potter books or lining up to see the movie, but some folks don't think the young wizard is the example they'd like for their children. CBN News reporter Andrea Garrett explains why. First, it was a wildly popular book series. Now it's a blockbuster movie that's breaking records for advanced online ticket sales. With a second movie due out next year, Harry Potter revenues could top a billion dollars. The Harry Potter books took the United Kingdom and America by storm. The children's fantasy series, written by British author J.K. Rowling, tells the story of an orphaned boy who discovers he's a wizard with magical powers. Harry is invited to attend the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, where he learns how to hone his craft with skills like broom riding, spell casting, and all about both the good and evil sides of magic. And it's not just Harry Potter books and movies. There's also the Harry Potter merchandise, out just in time for Christmas. Supporters say Harry Potter is harmless fantasy, and like librarian Carolyn Ford, praise the books for getting kids to read. There would be very few children that would have taken a 200-page book with no pictures in it and even attempted it. <laughs> and so that's making a big difference. But Harry Potter and his creator, author J.K. Rowling, aren't without critics. Some parents don't consider Harry Potter harmless at all. The books and the movie are full of occult imagery, and some parents worry that Harry Potter legitimizes witchcraft and opens a door to the occult for impressionable youngsters. The book's U.S. publisher is the highly respected Scholastic Books, which encourages teachers to read the books out loud to their students. Parent Elizabeth Mounts objects because she finds the books dark and disturbing. Our child came home, it was being read in his class, and um, the concern we had with these books was um, the violent tones in here. There's evil, there's death, there's lack of respect for human life, uh, and there's the occult. The Potter books have been translated into 47 languages and have sold more than 100 million copies. Kids are flocking to the Potter movie in droves. But the question persists, is Harry Potter harmless fantasy or does it encourage children to participate in witchcraft? Andrea Garrett, CBN News. Well, joining us now to help answer some of those questions is Carol Matriciana, who is an expert on the occult. She's the creative director for Jeremiah Films and has produced a documentary called Harry Potter Witchcraft Repackaged. Carol, it's a pleasure to have you here with Thank us you. on the 700 Club today. Thank you so much. You know, there are a lot of people out there right now who are saying, oh, here go those Christians again. <laughs> yep. They're on another soapbox. Why should Christian parents be concerned about a, a film that's being sort of touted as harmless? Well, first of all, let's see what Warner Brothers says about the film. Warner Brothers says that it's an accurate portrayal of witchcraft. So here we have witches across the nation endorsing Harry Potter, saying that more than any other time that Harry Potter has initiated such response to witchcraft that witches now have schools of witchcraft on the Internet where children can come be graduated into, get certificates of graduation to become witches, and of course the books have been promoted by Scholastic Inc., who have been the providers of curriculum for 80 years in public schools. So here, where religion, where Christianity has been taken out of the schools, or all religion indeed, here we have a wizard, Harry Potter, a witch, who goes to school with 350 other students to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, 
which has been repackaged as a reading incentive program promoted by Scholastic Inc., the publishers, in our schools, 32 million children a year are being reached by witchcraft repackaged. And J.K. Rowling herself, who is the author, says that she took more than a third of the research and the content of these so-called fantasy books from occult research. So she has drawn from history. She has drawn from mythology. She admits that she has drawn from the religions of uh, Celtic, Druidic, Satanic, Wiccan, pagan roots and written them into her fiction books for children. Now there would be a lot of people who would say, who might not even know what the Bible has to say about any of this, who would say, but if my kids are just going to enjoy this and they're not engaging in the practice of any of this, what's the harm? Well, the harm is first of all that witchcraft is being normalized to our children. For the first time in the history of the world, witchcraft is being given to children in a children's format and children are seeing other children practicing it and say it's all right. And especially if the parents are saying, well, it's okay to read about other children being involved in this religion, then children say, well, if they can be involved in it, so can I. Now remember that the School of Witchcraft and Wizardry is actually teaching all many of the basics that are in the religion of witchcraft. The Supreme Court has given witchcraft religious status. The IRS has given it tax exemption. So this is a religion. And this religion is being promoted through a child's level through the public schools on our tax dollar and teaching the children by occultists how to do certain, um, how to mix potions, how to put emphasis on certain spells, how to twist your arm and your wrist and how to concentrate when you want things. And the powers that Harry is tapping into are the powers that children think they can have. And people will say, oh, well, you know, my child doesn't practice those things. But there is also a morality that is being taught. Harry cheats. Harry lies. Harry steals. His teachers steal. When Harry breaks the rules, the teachers don't punish him. In fact, teachers say that rules are there to be broken. So children are learning a moral worldview that is not based on biblical principles. Well, you mentioned the scholastic book endorsement of all of this. Were you surprised at that? Surprised that scholastic has yes. brought it into the mm -hmm. schools? No, not really, because historically, scholastic, who has been the providers of curriculum, have been slowly bringing in more and more Wiccan material. But now to so blatantly promote this, and the most scary thing about it is that scholastic is attaching teaching aids to their curriculum. And the teaching aids are taking children into the internet to actual Wiccan official occult sites. So now, if a child just types in Harry Potter, they can log on to either pornography or actual Wiccan sites that proselytize the child further. In fact, if you go to very well-known big, large bookstores, just a few yards away from the display, as I did with this, um, Teen Witch Let's, Kit, show this? The, the Teen Witch Kit was not far from the Harry Potter display. And reading this book, there's an altar comes with it, a little pouch, a little pendant. And reading the book introduces a teenager into becoming a witch, how to say the spells, how to make her pentagram. own spells. The, there's the pentagram in there. Crystals, there's the, the crystal. <laughs> and this box actually makes into an altar so she can have her own altar in her bedroom. So. Here we see that Scholastic Inc., the publishers for Harry Potter, are leading little children into official Wiccan sites where parents have no idea that their children are being recruited. In fact, when I was doing research for the film Harry Potter Witchcraft mm -hmm. Repackaged, I went into these different websites and got emails back from witches thanking me for my interest in witchcraft. <laughs> I want to say that there are many parents out there who are very confused and who would like more information. And we want you to know that a number of the things that, that Carol has available, uh, you can find at our website. So if you'll visit CBN.com, avail yourself of this information. Find out what's going on. Don't let your kids just be sitting ducks out there in the middle of what's happening in our society today. Take a stand. This is an hour to do that. Carol, thank you so much. Thank God you, God bless Terry. you for your work. It's thank great you. to have you here.
J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series is the most popular children's book series ever written. Rowling's books and the subsequent movies based upon her books have helped initiate countless children into different forms of occult ideology. While Rowling acknowledges that sometimes it will take as much as a week to work something out in her stories, she admits that the initial story of Harry Potter and many of the other characters came in a stream of consciousness. Rowling admitted, quote, Harry as a character came fully formed, as did the idea of his sidekicks, the characters of Ron and Hermione, who is the brains of the threesome. She said, it started with Harry, then all three characters and situations came flooding into my head. Rowling describes the way that she writes as though she is often in a stream of consciousness, and that at times she is only taking notes of things she sees and hears and what sound like visions. She states, quote, I see a situation and then I try to describe it as vividly as I can, end quote. I have a very visual imagination. I see it, then I try to describe what is in my mind's eye. For author J.K. Rowling, it all started on a train. It was 1990, and she was traveling from Manchester to London. Rowling describes her own writing ability in writing the Harry Potter series, much in the same way she describes the channeling of spirits that takes place in the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Is it possible that J.K. Rowling herself is being used by spirit entities to indoctrinate our children into witchcraft? Joan Rowling not only describes her introduction to her main characters in such a way as describing what she sees, but Rowling states that when she writes the dialogue between characters, she simply takes notes from what she hears almost audibly. She states, quote, and I do love writing dialogue. Dialogue comes to me as though I'm just overhearing a conversation, end quote. Blavatsky is an obvious reference to H.P. Blavatsky, as Blavatsky is a perfect anagram for Blavatsky, who shares the same initials as Harry Potter. Her name is usually written as H.P. Blavatsky. Blavatsky's book, Unfogging the Future, is listed as a divination text at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry in the Harry Potter series, and recalls Isis Unveiled, which is Blavatsky's first major work. Blavatsky is, of course, along with Satanist Aleister Crowley, a Gnostic founder of the modern-day New Age movement, or Neo-Gnosticism. Blavatsky, in her secret doctrine, quotes occultist Eliphaz Levi approvingly, stating, quote, Satan is the angel who is proud enough to believe himself God, brave enough to buy his independence at the price of eternal suffering and torture, beautiful enough to have adored himself in full divine light, strong enough to reign in darkness amidst agony, and to have built himself a throne on his inextinguishable pyre, the prince of anarchy served by a hierarchy of pure spirits. We saw earlier how both Blavatsky and Crowley taught that Satan liberated humanity from the Creator as he initiated Eve in the Garden of Eden. Harry Potter's escape from the world of muggles, which are non-magical human beings, is precipitated by a communication that takes place between Harry Potter and a serpent. Harry Potter escapes from the material world of the muggles to the spiritual world of witchcraft and wizardry. After Harry Potter escapes the world of material illusions, he finds out that he actually has godlike powers. But it's interesting because J.K. Rowling also seems to be patterning the life of Harry Potter after the life of Satanist Aleister Crowley. Like Harry Potter, Crowley abandoned his strict upbringing claiming that his mother was a tyrannical religious bigot and went on to discover that he was a sorcerer joining several occult orders. Like Harry Potter, Crowley realized he was a wizard as a preteen. Crowley stated, quote, Before I touched my teens, I was already aware that I was the beast, whose number is 666. While Crowley would claim to have committed several human sacrifices, he claimed that he killed his first cat at the age of 11. According to J.K. Rowling, Harry began to find out that he was a wizard at age 11. In Harry Potter, The Goblet of Fire, page 20, it is stated, quote, It had been enough of a shock for Harry to discover on his 11th birthday that he was a wizard. As in Crowley's Satanism, in the Harry Potter series, the number 11 takes on special significance. Crowley writes that, quote, 11 is a number of magic in itself. He also writes that 11, quote, is a sacred number par excellence of the new age or new eon. It is written in the Book of the Law, 11, as all their numbers who are of us. Crowley claimed that the number 11 was his magic number. Crowley began to spell magic with the letter K at the end of magic because the letter K is the 11th letter of the alphabet and had a special Kabbalistic meaning to Crowley as a Satanist. Not only does Harry realize that he has occult powers at the age of 11, but the length of Harry's wand seems to have special significance as is perfectly suited for Harry Potter. In Harry Potter, the Goblet of Fire, page 310, we read, quote, Harry had weighed what felt like every wand in the shop. At last, he had found one that suited him. This one, which was made of holly, 11 inches long. 
Both Crowley and Harry did not only get their starts as sorcerers at the same age and under similar circumstances, but they both had distinguishing marks as children that revealed that they were sorcerers. For Harry Potter, this distinguishing mark, of course, was a lightning bolt. Crowley states in his confessions, at birth, I had three distinguishing marks. He states that, quote, over the center of my heart, I had four hairs curling from left to right in the exact form of a swastika. Before Hitler was, I am. Harry has a distinguishing mark on his forehead as well, which is an ancient occult symbol, a Nazi stylized lightning bolt. In an interview with Scholastic, when J.K. Rowling was asked, quote, Why did you choose the lightning bolt as a trademark for Harry Potter? Rowling stated, quote, Just because I decided that it would be an interesting and distinctive mark. End quote. It is interesting that Harry Potter's lightning bolt and Crowley's swastika both share a similar occult history. The lightning bolt has long been a symbol in the occult and Satanism. Crowley taught that the Satanist was to find his own magical path and that he was to follow the satanic maxim, do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law, to realize his true destiny as a magician. O guardians of the watchtower of the east, I, Ishtar, High Priestess and Witch, do summon and stir thee. I command thy presence at this, our meeting, to guard over our circle and to witness our rites. Witchcraft is the fastest growing offshoot of paganism and neo-paganism today. Hundreds of thousands of children and teenagers are joining its ranks according to reports from an ever-increasing number of pagan websites. The Pagan Federation of England claims their mailbags swell by the thousands from charmed teenagers every time a particularly exciting episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer airs on TV or an enticing article on witchcraft appears in a popular teen magazine. Witchcraft, or Wicca as it is known, believes in revering the mother goddess, the global environment, feminist practices and nature, the holy reed or rule, do what you want as long as it harms no one is Wicca's most appealing draw, encouraging its adherents to indulge in self-gratification and self-centeredness, while allowing morals to shift at will. Wicca teaches there is no absolute truth or sin and replaces the patriarchal male creator god of the Bible with a belief in both male and female gods. Most pagans and witches believe they must communicate with supernatural spirits, which they refer to as forces of nature. In order to receive wisdom and power for magical skills, they also embrace the concept of self-empowerment by awakening internal spirituality through meditation, visualization, and other mind-altering techniques of self-hypnosis. Dimly lit parlors or new age fairs are no longer the only places to practice secret magic, fortune-telling, spell-casting, or potion-mixing. As a result of aggressive marketing campaigns, a wide variety of witchcraft techniques offering powers of control for personal achievements can now be found in bookstores, on the internet, in public schools and libraries, and throughout the media. Hollywood's presentation of witchcraft, as exciting and glamorous, has further increased its appeal to young audiences. Enhanced by digital technology and revolutionary special effects, Occultic spells and rituals are given visually stunning portrayals, as are the depictions of supernatural beings, ghosts, demons, vampires, mythological characters, and even Satan. A growing number of cartoons and television dramas aimed at increasingly younger audiences further seduce children with the allure of sorcery and divination. Occultic themes are frequently woven into the storylines of primetime series, which has undoubtedly contributed to the practice of magic as being the fastest growing mystical attraction among teenagers. The spectacular growth of the internet, which occultists refer to as the portal of transcendence, has further fanned the fascination of spiritual alternatives. An unprecedented amount of occult literature is available online. At Amazon.com, for example, Consumers can find more than 1,850 books on witchcraft. And in addition, hundreds of websites are dedicated to marketing witchcraft specifically to children. 
Pagans and witches worldwide can now communicate and perform ritual magic online through an ever-expanding number of highly networked, occult-oriented chat rooms. Countless websites now offer everything from poison rings to spells for young people seeking empowerment. Each year, thousands of teens are turning their backs on Christianity and joining witches' covens in order to learn spells so as to pass school exams, attract boyfriends or girlfriends, and get rich. The secretary of the Magic Circle's Young Magicians Club credits the Harry Potter books as the latest rage, which he says has rekindled the childlike approach to the fact that the impossible may be possible. He gives thanks to Harry, who he says has sparked an interest in pure magic, real magic, strong magic. Harry Potter, the orphan child wizard, already famous in his own magical world because he survived the murderous black magic death curse of the evil Lord Voldemort, has now duplicated his fame in the real world. Under the category of children's fantasy literature, sales of Harry Potter books have received phenomenal acceptance worldwide, breaking all records in children's literature. With over 100 million books sold in 200 countries, Harry Potter has been translated into more than 40 languages. A massive global marketing campaign, partnered by Warner Brothers, Mattel, and Coca-Cola, guarantees that the Harry Potter image will be kept before the public for years to come through films, toys, video games, and every type of merchandising product imaginable. According to a U.S. Consumer Research Survey, over half of all children between the ages of 6 and 17 have read at least one Harry Potter book, with thousands reporting multiple readings of all of the books. These volumes range anywhere from 309 to 734 pages. While many parents are thrilled by the prospect of their children taking an interest in reading, other parents and educators view Harry Potter as the latest tool being used to disciple children into the darkest aspects of black magic. Through Harry Potter books and audios, children as young as kindergarten age are being introduced to human sacrifice, the sucking of blood from dead animals, and possession by spirit beings. Set in England, the Harry Potter story begins on Halloween night with the murder of Harry's parents by the evil Lord Voldemort. Through the sacrificial goddess magic of his mother's love, baby Harry is saved and his blood is given magical powers. Unable to kill Harry in revenge, Voldemort sears a death curse of a lightning bolt on Harry's forehead. In the real world, thousands of young fans demonstrate their allegiance to Harry by taking the mark of the lightning bolt on their own foreheads. There's no such thing as magic. Dear Mr. Potter, you have been accepted to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Harry is magically selected to attend the 1,000-year-old Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Both Voldemort and Harry's parents attended the prestigious boarding school before him. All of Hogwarts' teachers are practicing occultists and instruct their students in the proper use of magic tools, spells, and rituals. Headmaster Albus Dumbledore owns a phoenix, the powerful mythological bird, the symbol of resurrection. The magical wands of both Harry and Voldemort share the same power, which is a tail feather from Dumbledore's phoenix. Therefore, in the world of Harry Potter, the power source of Harry's so-called good magic and Voldemort's evil magic is one and the same. The question is, should parents be concerned that the alluring power behind witchcraft is being made to look innocent and is being targeted towards their children through the Harry Potter phenomenon?
I read the first one eight times, the second one three times, and the fourth one, I mean the third one, four times. So does the hubbub over Harry Potter seem outlandish, or do parents have a real argument here? Well, joining us now from Columbia, South Carolina is Steve Mounts. He is a parent who has expressed concerns about the book's use at schools. Also joining us is Jennifer James from Watertown, Massachusetts. She is a children's book buyer for Wordsworth Books. All right, Mr. Mounts, let me start with you. These are number one books on the bestsellers list, winner of the National Book Award in the UK. Kids love them. So what do you find particularly objectionable about these books? The thing that we found, my wife and I found objectionable, was it was being read aloud to our son in his class. And uh, there were things that we believe had a religious connotation to them, witchcraft, Wicca, uh, which the Supreme Court has now said is a religion. The IRS has given it religious status. Uh, the military's got Wicca chaplains. And we just wanted an opportunity to find out, is this religion being taught in our son's class? Now, you went before the South Carolina Board of Education earlier this week. Uh, what are you asking the board to do? We asked them to review the book for religious content, for violence. Uh, in this post-Columbine era that we're living in, uh, we felt like uh, with kids living out their fantasies, uh, this book may have potential for that. Jennifer James, let me go to you now. What do you like about the Harry Potter books? What value do they have, do you think? I think they're some of the greatest books written for children. They're full of adventure and fantasy, and every kid loves them. All right, well, let's take a look at a couple of passages from the book here. The, this is from book one. See what I have become, the face said, mere shadow and vapor. I have form only when I can share another's body. But there have always been those willing to let me into their hearts and minds. Unicorn blood has strengthened me these past weeks. Yikes, unicorn blood? Uh, Jennifer, you hear that and you think, well, maybe uh, Mr. Mounts has a point here. I think it's just fantasy. It's, it's a book. It's not reality. And I think children can make the difference. They can draw the line. Well, Steve, that's a good point. Don't you think that uh, fourth and fifth graders are smart enough to be able to distinguish? Don't you think your son knows the difference between fantasy and reality? He'd probably have a hard time finding a unicorn in South Carolina, but <laughs> uh, most of the time when we have uh, police reports of the occult or witchcraft, it always involves an animal sacrifice. So if they can't find a unicorn, they're perfectly willing to take a dog, a cat, a goat, or anything else they can to get their hands on. Well, Steve, um, the author says these are moral books, and I want to play some sound from when she was on the Today Show yesterday, if we can roll that. Do we have that? I made a very conscious decision at, right at the beginning that I was writing about someone evil, and I wasn't going to tell a lie. I wasn't going to pretend that an evil person is a cardboard cutout and no one really gets hurt. Okay, if you're writing about evil, I think you, you genuinely you have a responsibility to show what that means. and. That's why I'm writing them the way I'm writing them. I think they're quite, well, actually, I think they're very moral books. Steve Mounts, uh, there seems to be some merit in what she just said. How can you argue with that? I think the merit in what she said was they are evil books. Um, I think parents can make a decision on whether they want their children to read these books. She was, by the way, responding to a quote that my wife had given before the school board about the books being violent, and I applaud her for saying they were violent. Um, so apparently there's no disagreement on that. Jennifer James, you are a children's book buyer at the bookstore. Are you finding this to be a real phenomenon at your store, these books? Yes, we've never seen anything like it. It's unbelievable and we're all very happy. Right. Well, what makes you happiest about it? Is it the sales or is it the fact that kids are really loving to read now? The children run into the store, want to buy the book and sit down and start reading it before they leave the store. Mm. Robert McGee is the author of The Search for Significance and founder of the Rafa Treatment Centers. There are those who defend the Harry Potter books by saying they're just fantasy. And so when people object to these books, they're made to look like fools because the people say, how can you object to these books? They're just fantasy. But that line of reasoning would tell you that you could include in fantasy any violence, pornography, whatever you wanted, and still defend those books by that very same statement. As an expert in world religions, noted cult and occult researcher Carol Matriciana 
has authored the best-selling books, Gods of the New Age and The Evolution Conspiracy, and has written and produced numerous videos for Jeremiah Films. Many argue that Harry Potter is just merely children's fantasy, and therefore it's harmless. The lie about this is that witchcraft is reality. J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter series, has gone through an awful lot of research. She is very accurate, otherwise we would have witches all over the country and the world saying this is not a true representation of our religion. This is a true representation of witchcraft and the black arts and black magic and yet we have people that say this is merely fantasy and harmless reading for our children. Actually, what makes this more dangerous is that it is couched in fantasy language and children's literature and made to be humorous and beautifully written and extremely provocative reading. And it just opens up children to want to have the next one. This is what is so harmful. Joanne Rowling majored in mythology in Exeter University in England. She has borrowed not only from pagan religions, Celtic religions, the religions of the Druids, witchcraft, Satanism, a lot of the spells, the incantations, the, the philosophy behind the mythology and the religions is being put into Harry Potter's books. Yes, Harry Potter may be fictional, but there is a lot of religious teaching in symbols that perhaps the reader doesn't always pick out. The actual word Potter, if you ask a pagan, a witch, any knowledgeable expert in the occult or hidden arts, the potter is the female goddess, the goddess of Babylon, who is considered the potter who created human beings from clay. And they believe that the patriarchal God of Christianity, the, the God of Israel, copied that in a very poor imitation because he cannot give birth. Now listen to how important that is to understand. The feminine-oriented cult of witchcraft sees the woman and her process of birth as fundamental in the new life, the transformation, the alchemy, the changing of the inner man to higher consciousness, which is what Harry Potter is all about. In fact, that's what the first book is called, The Sorcerer's Stone, the alchemy of being transformed and changed through the inner man to become a new creature, which is again an, a, an upside down reversal of what a Christian believes that when they come into understanding a relationship, a personal relationship with Christ, they are transformed and take on the mind of Christ. The concept of fertility-based cults, feminine-oriented cults such as witchcraft, is the concept that the new birth can take place inside, through meditation, you have inner transformation, inner wisdom, inner knowledge. And all this is done through concentration, visualization, all through Harry's books. Hamani and others say, concentrate, Harry. If you concentrate hard enough, you can have what you want. One of the arguments is that Harry Potter's series does not actually teach witchcraft, that it is not teaching the concepts of Mother Goddess and her consort, the Horned God, which is essential to the fertility uh, cults or the fertility-oriented witchcraft religion. And yes, there are the concepts of Mother Goddess being taught because Harry's mother gave her life for Harry. The sacrificial death that she gave through love is a symbolism of goddess worship. It's an inversion, if you will, of God the Father whose son gave his life in love for his people. Now, the concept of teaching mother goddess is very, very important. 
Harry's mother gave her life for Harry so that he should be saved and through this love sacrifice Harry was protected from death. Now this concept is brought up several times. In fact, it is so important in witchcraft and pagan thinking that Voldemort, Harry's arch enemy, takes a vial of blood from Harry in book number four in order to have the blood run through his own veins in order that he can be resurrected and have a body. That is how powerful the blood sacrifice is. Another scary aspect of black magic is shape changing. The concept of being able to become an animal, change into an animal. Harry's father appears to Harry in a shape change later on, even though he's dead, he appears as a stag, the horned god. So here we have the concept that shape changing is very normal. It is horrible. And the Bible clearly, clearly says that we are made as human beings when God created us and we cannot become something else. You might perceive you're becoming something else, but it's supernatural deception. The evil Lord Voldemort also went to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry with Harry's parents. And we're not awfully sure what the reasons are, but for perhaps jealousy because Harry's parents represented practicing the white side or the good side of magic. Voldemort, at the birth of Harry, wanted to kill Harry and Harry's parents. But somehow in this horrible battle, some of Voldemort's powers came to Harry and Harry got a death curse, a bolt of lightning, on his forehead as a mark of the curse from Voldemort. Also another interesting thing happened. Harry also acquired a power that he was able to talk to snakes, which is the same gift that the evil Lord Voldemort has. There is a connection with the talking snakes, Voldemort always represented as a snake, and by the way, both of them, Harry and Voldemort, share the power of the phoenix tail in their wand, and the phoenix, again, is a symbol of resurrection. Witchcraft is a religion, it gets tax-exempt status, it has a military chaplain, and it is recognized as a religion, a practicing religion. It is the fastest growing religion in America, incidentally, as well. I regard myself as a natural witch. Um, I was uh, regarding myself as a witch since early childhood. Um, I was brought up in a very isolated part of the country, uh, on the Welsh border, which has a long tradition of magic and uh, Welsh sorcerers. Since I have been practicing the craft, there has been a great revival. There are probably now as many people practicing witchcraft as there are Christians. It's almost as if there's a kind of grassroots feeling back towards paganism. We live in a kind of post-Christian era almost, and that people are moving towards a kind of neo-paganism, I suppose. Witchcraft is the religion of the countryside. It's the religion of very old forms of knowledge. And paganism is a religion which is a very old form of knowledge too. But paganism covers more than witchcraft covers. Witchcraft is, if you like, a division of paganism. Well, witchcraft is basically a nature religion. We, uh, we worship the gods of the woods and the fields. Those who practice witchcraft choose to believe there is no Satan and therefore no evil spirits. Yet they report experiencing spiritual powers from which they receive their power. Refusing to label these powers evil, they choose to believe their origin is either from nature or natural from within, but neutral. When I was a child, I was very aware of nature spirits, those which are called diva or local gods. 
we learn as practicing witches to tap into forces of nature and to actually, if you like, send out a spell or an invocation um, in a very powerful way. The primary offer of witchcraft is power, a very seductive power. One day, a young 18-year-old girl came to see me. Her life was almost ruined by her preoccupation with witchcraft, but she would not give that power up because it was the only power in her life that she could count on. Another young man came to see me and said, I know how powerful these forces are, and I look at the lives of Christians, and I think my power is more powerful than what they're experiencing. The one of the most disturbing things about the Harry Potter books is it teaches children that witchcraft is for children. It does this by allowing children to read about other children in a school setting and watching these children learn how to use spells and all the other elements of witchcraft. It teaches these children that witchcraft is just not for adults, but that children can access this power and use this power also. If you say there is no real power in witchcraft, then you should have no problem with the Harry Potter books. But there are two problems with your line of reasoning. First of all, you're denying the experience of hundreds of thousands of people who have practiced witchcraft through the ages. Plus, you're saying that God's warning in the Bible about divination, sorcery, and all the elements of witchcraft is actually worthless. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, it states, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, God identifies witchcraft as a sin. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Despite God's warning, many youth, including Christian youth, don't see much harm in witchcraft. So they see their friends casting spells and being involved in all manner of witchcraft and do not understand the dangers. They do not know that they're opening doors in their life to spirits which will come in and create very compulsive behaviors. And this is why many in witchcraft are compulsively into drug usage and to sexual activity and all manner of conduct which is very destructive. And yet, why should they be concerned when they hear nothing from the adults that warn them of what's coming? When a child is captured by witchcraft, they rarely choose to get out until very much later in their life after they have lived a very miserable existence. The giant introduces Harry uh, to the paraphernalia of witchcraft that Harry is going to now use in his boarding school, Hogwarts. And this is done in Diagnon Alley, which is a sort of spiritual occult supermarket, flea market, if you will, a street filled with shops of cauldrons, owls, robes, uh, wands, all the paraphernalia that is used today by witches in their rituals and ceremonies and spells today. So the reader is vicariously introduced to the tools of the trade that form the basis of the religion of witchcraft. Many have argued that Joanne Rowling is not teaching the children witchcraft and uh, the books are not about witchcraft because the spells aren't legitimate spells and because J.K. Rowling just pulls out very, very funny Latin words and she obviously knows her Latin and she's very humorous with the way that she tosses out expelleramus, which gets rid of a spell or any of the other numbers of spells that she puts in in Latin. Patrificus totalis. The principle is that if you learn certain words, you can have power. And the books, the Harry Potter series, are connected to websites that get you into arenas where there are experts at teaching you the spells, the legitimate spells. What the reader is being introduced into in Harry is that is, there is legitimacy 
in rituals and spells, which are a sort of another word, let's say, of repetitive prayers, as Jesus said in Matthew, that don't be like the Gentiles and the pagans that just repeat their prayers for what they want. Queen of heaven, queen of hell, hornet hunter of the night, lend your power unto our spell and work our will by magic right. This is what spells are, repetitive prayer, repetitive prayer, which sort of induces a self-hypnosis that gives you the idea that your inner potential power, your psychic abilities, can bring about what you are visualizing in your head. While love spells probably isn't the focus of Harry's books right at the moment because he's 11, 12, 13 in book four there is a sort of beginning of a relationship that Harry is involved in a sort of affectionate uh, opposite sex thing but love spells are very 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 important in witchcraft in fact because it is a fertility cult the concept the, the focus in on sex and cosmic union for power is one of the important aspects of witchcraft. So it is no wonder that many, many teenagers are being lured into witchcraft through, in a sense, the magic of love. They want the boy they want, or they want the girl they want, and so they get involved in spells. And the websites are also pushing the fact of teaching children love spells. As above, so below. Then, of course, Hollywood glamorizes the whole concept, and through this film, The Craft, you can see that here, where the girl wants to have her boy, she gets involved in this ceremony, very powerful ceremony, calling down the love spirits, and, of course, she gets the boy she wants, and he doesn't know what is happening, and why he is being seduced, in a sense, through his spirit, how this happened, but there it is again, showing that spells work. I drink of my sisters and I ask to love myself more and to allow myself to be loved more by others. Especially Chris Hooker. <laughs> I know, it's pathetic. It's definitely pathetic. Well, it's just that, you know, I can't stop thinking about you and I don't know why, but I think I love you. And I've never loved anyone before except well, maybe my mom and, and well, this little puppy that I had when I was little. <laughs> I, I think you should go home, Chris. No, Sarah, wait, please, Sarah, please. Look, I don't know what's happening to me. I, I, I can't eat, I can't sleep. Uh, can I help you? No, nobody can help me. In dealing with the child trafficking situation, now you did relay to me some information, uh, you know, that you were able to see uh, from an inside standpoint uh, of the CIA's knowledge of, uh, of various uh, traffickers of, of children and, 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 and where they're located. I mean, can you really just talk about that a little bit, what you saw, I mean, from an inside standpoint, so people can yeah. really get a picture of this? Uh, uh, so I was going to make you some, uh, some information and some, you know, some, some, some computer sheets, if you will, looking at the computer board. And, uh, you know, and I came aware of a couple things. One, um, slavery is like an all-time high right now. Right? It's, it's probably greater or, or at least tied for the greatest of, of, of any other time in the history of the world. That's slavery. We don't realize that because we keep on thinking slavery is a bunch of people on a farm being whipped somewhere. But nevertheless, uh, the CIA is involved in it. It was the Army's job. Uh, and some of the information I got from them was to track some of this stuff that goes on. Okay. And children are moved all through the United States, they're moved through Mexico, and they're moved for a number of reasons. Some of them are for sexual reasons, some are for pedophilia reasons, but some are for satanic reasons, and those are those people will be sacrificed. Um, various things that go along around the world. And uh, their network of underground is very good. And in fact, uh, they protect these interests very good from local police and the local authorities. Stop for a second. I want you to say it one more time. Are you saying that this, the CIA actually protects some of these individuals from the local authorities? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, and you're now with the Forerunner Chronicles right now. 
we're out in the graveyard and we're here for a particular reason because I want you to see that this whole thing about the occult is not a joke. Now according to some research that Captain Uriah did, if you watch that video that we did with Captain Uriah dealing with 9-11 and the occult, according to his research into the occult, in their literature they believe that occult energy emits from the very front gate of a graveyard. And so if you want to set up a house in which you're going to have occult practices taking place, you're going to want to set that house up directly in front of the front gate of the graveyard. And not just directly in front of the front gate, but you're going to want, the, you're going to want that front door of that house to be directly in line with the front gate of the graveyard. Now I want you to see this because this is, this is some pretty shocking stuff. Now we're taking a little walk through the graveyard here, right? Now here's the front gate of the graveyard, obviously. I want you to take a close look at this house that we're getting ready to go up on. Come on. Now if you get a look at this, this is some pretty sick stuff. I don't know if you can get a close up on those windows there. They have black curtains covering every window here. Some really sick, sad and black curtains up there. Looks something looks like something straight out of a vampire movie. We got black coverings over these windows here and they have plexiglass on the windows. So it's not glass that you can just break with a stone or something here. Now look at this stairwell. And notice the basement has no windows. Everything stone. Alright? So if you're going to want to get out of this place, you're going to have to jump from at least the second floor here. But anyhow, let's go up the stairwell here. Alright, let's see if anybody's home right in the back. Now just in case you might think that this place is abandoned, it's not. There's somebody that comes here every day. They take the mail out of the mailbox. As you can see, the lawn is groomed, it's manicured, the whole place is taken care of. But there are people that come here ever so often, and then those two lights will be on here. You'll see a light on here, and then you'll see a light on in this window over here. And according to uh, some sightings, it might be uh, late at night, there'll be limos that'll pull up here, and the police will block off the street, and nobody can come in because, you know, they'll give them some, you know, some stupid reason. But there's obviously activity going on here. Alright? Now, obviously nobody's coming, um, coming here. Now, let me just let you get a look at something. You might want to even go down there as I come down. Because I want everybody to uh, get a look at this. Now, Right now, I'm directly in front of the front door, okay? Right. Directly in front of the front door. All right. Now, I'm going to take a straight walk from this front door, and let's see where we are lined up with. Now, as I walk directly from the front door, it's directly in line with the front gate of the graveyard. All right? And not only that, everybody, but check this out. Let's hurry up before somebody uh, might want to bother us with this one. Now, you just want to see this. 
this as well. I want you to take a look at this garage, because this is really creepy stuff. Notice the garage. Look at this. There's a wall here in front of the garage, but that's not it. Take a look at this garage. Everything is covered up. You can't see anything inside. Even this side, black curtains over the window. And then look at this little slim door that you got here. Perfect to put little children through if you're trying to bring them inside and use them for whatever occult practices that you might be partaking in. This is truly textbook. This is textbook according to their literature. Now I'm not going to tell you what you should believe, but I'm going to tell you that something's not right, and you need to take mind of it. Okay, go. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah, that's because it's a, it's a, it's a job I trust. It's, it's one of their jobs, and also it's maybe their. It's problems. absolutely it's sick, by the way. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it is sick. But you know, you gotta look. Everything has a foundation. Whatever it is, it has like a foundation. You wanna find out about an organization or a person? You go to the foundation. You gotta see if you got a, a good one. Or if you've got a corrupt one, if something's built corruptly, it will, no matter what you do in the future, it'll always be corrupt. 